meeting, regular meeting of the Neshoba Regional School Committee uh, to order. <coughs> Those who want to may rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I always want to say, please be seated, because that's what I used to say as a principal. <laughs> After, please rise. Okay. Oh, and we're on. All right. So the first order of business <coughs> is the school choice hearing. Is anyone here um, to speak about school choice? So I will going to uh, adjourn the school choice hearing and move to um, citizens' comments. Is there anyone here for citizens' comments? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I let, they want, if, some, if somebody's here to speak on citizen comment, yes. um, go ahead. But I did, have a, I did want to make a comment about something else, but go ahead. No, nobody's here. Okay. I mean, they're here, well, but I, not for that. <laughs> this is a better joke. Okay, all right. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm just a little bit confused about something relative to um, the public hearing we just held. Yes. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, um, the notice that was sent regarding the public hearing. Um, not that it's a big deal, but the statutory reference is incorrect. Oh. It's chapter 76, not chapter 77, which is the choice. The script is there, it does say school choice on there. Mm -hmm. But what's a little more disconcerting to me is that um, the agenda doesn't provide for a public hearing. It, it says school choice hearing. At the very top. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't even see it. I didn't see it either, I'm joke. sorry, I, you know, I, I started looking at number one. Oh, no, I no, 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 uh, yeah, I yeah. didn't see it either. In fact, I called um, Brooke and said, I thought we were doing the school choice here. Ne never mind, I didn't, I didn't see it. I started at one and went right down there. Never That's mind. what I did. Okay. Great so, lines. All right, yeah, okay. Okay, we're good? We're good. Thank this, you so much. The Scrivener's error, though, we'll, have, we'll go out back and take a look at that, um, if, if that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, not an issue for me, but no, no, no. But I think we we want to make sure that that's correct. Yeah. So we'll we'll take a look back at that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go out of order if there's no objection and um, throw it over to Ibby with the student representative report. Sure. Um. So, for starters, happy holidays. Um, Thank also, you. Uh, so here at Florence Sawyer, the robotics team, the Golden Turtle Squad. Um, they are headed to the Massachusetts State Tournament, um, Robonautica, and then there was um, a choir concert scheduled for tomorrow, but it's being postponed due to lack of rehearsal days, so there's no date for it, but it's going to be after vacation. At Hale, um, they had their winter dance last week, and a few of the uh, student musicians and their director, Ms. <coughs> Morrill, actually played live music during the dance. And the boys and girl basket, uh, girls basketball teams, um, they're traveling to Luther Burbank tomorrow, and so the boys will tip off at 3:30, and the girls will play at 4:45. Um, the kindergarten students at uh, Mary Rollinson <coughs> built gingerbread houses last week while grades one through five learned how to code. And also at um, the Thayer Memorial Library tonight, teachers from Mary Rollinson Elementary School will read some of their favorite books. <coughs> Um, at this cozy winter story time, and students are welcome to wear their pajamas and bring their favorite stuffed animal. The stuffies are also invited to spend the night at the library for some fun adventures. Uh, there will be winter craft activities, um, and that is all at the Thayer Memorial Library tonight at 6.30 p.m. And then at Center School, um, there was also a gingerbread activity this morning for the first graders at Luther Burbank. Um, there is a, the school nurse and a Luther Burbank parent, Sarah Cons Consentino, has been selected as a member of Team Jocelyn Diabetes Center to run in the 2020 <coughs> Boston Marathon. So she's collecting gently used shoes and sneakers of all kinds. Um, so this team will get 40 cents per pound of gently used footwear, which is going to be repurposed. Uh, there was a winter concert planned for yesterday the 17th but is now being held tomorrow at 6.30 in the Mary Rollinson Auditorium. Up at the high school, Junior National Honor Society member Leo Lukes-Jevitz is running a backpack drive. These backpacks are going to be filled with other donated items and then brought to Boston to be handed out to the homeless. 
Uh, the band and choir concert uh, was very successful last weekend. Um, and then Thursday, the day before during the <coughs> lunch period, they played their repertoire for the Councils on Aging and after the students munched on cookies and chatted with the senior citizens. For sports, uh, we had basketball starting this week. <coughs> the girls have their game tomorrow versus Natick at seven o'clock at home. Um, wrestling will travel to Levenster tonight for a 6.30 match and Tingsville <coughs> on Friday. The hockey team is playing tonight at seven in Groton and swim has a meet on Friday at 6.30. That is all I have for today. Well, that's a lot. Thank yeah. you so much. <coughs> any, questions? any questions for Ivy? I just have a quick question. Um, I know that you sent, you shared the document with me today because I just said how much I love the pictures, mm -hmm. but I, do, I don't see that it's up here, so I'm thinking that we must not have shared it. I don't know if we're able to go into my emails there and find it because she, uh, they were really nice pictures. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. going to take me a little, a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. You don't have to do it this second, but if we get a chance to put them up there yeah, tonight, please. we will because I just, I, I love the pictures that you included with yeah. it, so you did a really nice job. Thank you. So maybe when you send it to me, share it with Alita as well so okay, that we can, so that she's got it, so that we can make sure it's up there when you present. And sure. it will be, be yeah, it'd be good to have this part of the meeting materials also. Okay. Okay, yeah. that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Happy holidays to you, Happy too. Holidays. And thank you so much Enjoy. for having us. Maybe we get a break. Are you one of those people yeah. that works in California? Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of my senior trip because I'm back with Spartans all summer, so I'll be away on summer. <coughs> so. Wonderful. We're about to California, go. Oh, we're starting in San Francisco and then working our way down to San Diego. Awesome. How fun. Have a wonderful thank time. time. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, chair update. The first item is um, uh, um, the investigation update. So I received this letter from Tim Norris today, and so I will read it. Um, Dear Mrs. Codian, as promised, I am writing to provide an update on my investigation. Since commencing the investigation, I have interviewed over 10 individuals including school staff members and people from outside agencies. I still have at least a handful of interviews yet to conduct, including some that are already scheduled. I have also received and reviewed numerous documents made available to me by district personnel. So far, I am happy to report that all those interviewed so far have been cooperative and candid. I am unable to provide details at this time without compromising the investigation. I can tell you that I have assured all those spoken to that the committee will not tolerate any retaliation against anyone who participates in the investigation. I am aware that at least one community <coughs> member that I have not interviewed has asked whether there will be a mechanism to allow individuals to come forward to contribute information to the investigation. Please pass along to the community my invitation to members of the community, whether they are school staff, students, or parents, <coughs> to contact me if they have information pertinent to this investigation. I ask only that those contacting me do so because they have actionable, detailed, factual information about matters within the scope of the investigation as contrasted with rumors or opinions about matters connected with the investigation. The scope of the investigation is the handling of information regarding Ms. Varaka by district staff beginning in June 2019, those with information can reach me by email or telephone through my firm's website. The address is given, and I'll be in touch soon to provide a further update. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to telephone me. So this will be posted um, with the meeting materials. Um, Tim's uh, phone number through his um, law office and the email through his law office are posted therein. And so um, uh, people who are interested in contacting him may. So um, after the meeting tonight, this will be up on the website. <coughs> and just another FYI, other information that we have shared, um, the a letter of engagement and also uh, the first email about confidentiality and in investigation from December 4th are also part of the meeting materials for the meetings where they were uh, brought up. Okay, any questions for me? Yes. Uh, just for the record, maybe we should tell people listening that there is a tab on the home page of the NRSD website that says school committee. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that is agendas and meeting materials. 
and that's where all that information would be found. Thank you. Good point. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, Elaine, um, I'm going to let you uh, talk <coughs> about the design thinking, and I think you had some other stuff to share. So, it's all uh, yours. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so on, let's see, was it Monday? Um, I was invited in to listen to and provide feedback for a design thinking project um, that students in business classes and English classes with uh, Mrs. Grigas and Mrs. Foley Praco and involving Mrs. Murata, um were working on. And it was actually it was a really cool project because they had done design a design thinking project in the spring that got some press in the local paper and members of the Randall Library at Stowe said, huh, we are doing a redesign of the library. Maybe they could help us with that. So they contacted the school um, and put together a partnership where the students would work on a project thinking about design, redesigning some of the spaces for seniors, teens, and kids in the library. Um, and there, I handed out um, a packet that talks a little bit more about the project itself, but it was really about identifying the right questions to ask, then determining what the problems were, and then thinking about how you would go about the solutions. Um, and it was, it was amazing to see the kids. They were, uh, I think, freshmen all the way up to seniors. There were lots of different <coughs> groups coming through. Um, how eloquent they were. Um, some were very nervous with public speaking. Some were incredibly comfortable with it. Um, but it was great to get up there and see them um, engaged and presenting the interaction with the members of the Randall Library's trustees and the staff um, was fantastic because this was a real world problem and they were thinking about real world solutions. They had some incredibly creative ideas um, and they had done their research. I mean, they got challenged on some of their design choices and it was just, it was really inspiring to see how they handled those questions and how um, they were able to say, yeah, I did the research and this is what we found and and this is why we're making these recommendations. Um, and it was the kind of deep learning and um, not what you know, but what you do with what you know mm -hmm. um, that we are asking of students uh, moving into the 21st century. So it was just a great example um, of seeing that. And um, yeah, so oh. it was just like, it was, it was an honor to just to be there, to be able to listen to it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Miss Ann Needle from the Stowe Independent was there. They're going to do Wonderful. another, oh, that's another report on it as well. Well, thanks so. for going and reporting. Oh, and the things you handed out to us <coughs> are yeah. So that's oh. just more information about design thinking and how it you know how it relates oh. to the curriculum. Okay. The um, the other handout that I gave to people was just some information that I had gathered through the, at the MASC conference. Mm -hmm. Kind of a general FYI about the history of education and mandates and um, what are the tr general trends in education that I just sort of am finally filtering through all the material that they give you at these types of conferences and thought, oh, this is good general FYI. Like, you know, people might know it and they might not know it, but it might be good to have. Well, thank you. I appreciate your work. Thanks. Okay. Um, just a reminder to subcommittee uh, <coughs> chairs, please make sure that your minutes are up to date and posted appropriately. Just said if they have approved, send them to Alita and she will post them on the appropriate site. Okay, so the other thing I have is uh, I wanted to tell you about um, something that um, Elaine and I participated in this month. Um, back in the beginning of the month, I was invited to attend the professional learning team on uh, student voice. And I went to talk to the kids about the role of the school committee and also our policy JIB, which is student role in decision making. And um, it's something that the committee had expressed um, an interest in, and I know that we'll unpack it more as we move along, but it would be interesting to get a sense of what was on the mind of, of uh, the students. <coughs> there was another PLT, the Student Voice PLT, on December 13th, and Elaine was able to attend with me. The first meeting had about 13 kids, the second about 24. Some of the kids came twice. Um, and it was, it was um, I, I think, a nice event. And all we did, we gave our spiel about what we do, and we talked about JIB and how we're um, looking for ways to um, include student voice and decision making. Um, but we didn't 
talk about that. We just listened um, to the things that were on their mind. And um, I don't want to go into real specifics and jump in where you need to, but I think some big issues emerged uh, that <coughs> caused me to, to frame some questions. So the big um, issues were around communication, writ large, and also about um, environment, environmental concerns related to how green the high school is and, and food and, and all sorts of other things. So very thoughtful um, um, uh, questions and um, I was very impressed with the way the students presented themselves and the questions that they had, but just their comments on things. Um, so I think that, and I, I'm not expecting answers today, but it made me wonder, given what they were talking about, about several things. So I'll just um, read the questions and then I'll send them over to you, <laughs> right? So one of the questions I had is, what infrastructure is in place to dis disseminate or discuss information with students? And besides the NESC survey, which I think is administered like every 10 years and maybe they do a follow-up in between, I'm not sure, um, and the vocal survey, which is after the MCAS mm -hmm. and just for sophomores. Um, are there any instruments used to get information on students' views, feelings, etc.? cetera? Uh, what practices exist um, that support including students' voice in, decision, <coughs> in decisions that impact them? So what is in place, if it's organizations or a system, but what is currently in place at the high school that would allow students to influence decision making? Um, what communication systems are there in place to keep students informed on day-to-day -day matters as well as something out of the ordinary that has happened? Uh, what systems are in place that allow students to voice dissenting opinions? And what plans are in place for um, social emotional learning, professional development at the high school? So I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add or anything that you thought of after the meeting. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was an honor um, that the students sort of invited us in. Because um, some of the things they said were very blunt, very candid. Um, and some of them were downright brave um, that they were discussing these issues. And they were doing it in the best possible civil discourse I could imagine. Mm -hmm. Like, they were civil and thoughtful and disagreed with each other in very appropriate ways. I mean, it was probably went as best as best I could imagine that type of discussion mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. um, that was great. Um, the, yeah, communication was definitely the big issues. Environmental sustainability, meaning like <coughs> climate change, not learning environments, um, kept kept coming back to it. Mm -hmm. The students kept bringing this up. Different mm -hmm. students bringing it up, mm -hmm. um, and so we hear a lot about that being. Uh, like a, a national issue that, oh, the young people care about climate change. It's a big issue for them. Like, it's not just other kids, it's our kids right <coughs> in town. Um, and then the other thing that, that came out of it, and I think, I think it ties into your last question, SEL, mm -hmm. um, was just about the pressure that these kids are feeling. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. where this pressure is coming from. I, I don't think it's I'm not blaming the schools or their parents or colleges or anyone in particular, but the kids are definitely feeling it, and it was heartbreaking <coughs> to hear some of their concerns about how one piece, such as taking the SATs, was going to determine the future of their entire lives. And it just it broke my heart to, to know that they're feeling that, so when we talk about SAL, like that has to be a part of it. And I'm sure it's, it's most acute at the high school level, but I, I'm guessing it's starting a lot earlier as well. So how are we going to address that as part of our overall social emotional learning. So overall, there's probably um, um, close to 40 students that, that we heard from. Um, and I know that in a school of almost a 1,000 kids, that's a, a small sample. But I think it really <coughs> um, begs the question for me is how do we get um, a cross-section of students here from a more di diverse group? But I don't know, I think that when we're invited, we can listen. But in terms of the nitty gritty, um, looking at issues that are important to them, it's, it's not our job per se, but I think our job is to ask the questions and to see what comes out of it. And it's not, I don't feel like, I feel like um, 
this is based on um, an observation. I'm not trying uh, to be critical of, of what's going on or, or anything like that. High schools, as we have two members who work in high schools, and I have experience in high schools, as does the rest of the administration, they're complex places anyway. They're more complex than elementary schools and middle schools. And then developmentally, the students are so different. The difference between a freshman and a senior is, is just phenomenal. So how are we meeting the needs? Uh, how are the needs of those students being met? And in, in the front of my mind is always our, our mission to uh, educate all students so that they can achieve to their best potential in a safe and caring environment. So the, the essential question for me is, how is that being actualized at our high school? And if work needs to be done, how do we best support that work to be done? So I don't know if anybody has any, any questions or, or comments. Yeah, Leah. So I would say that the PLC that you're referencing, yep. a PLT, um, it, those kids meet in the late starts and they meet after the half day. We, not during the school day. And I have to add that this was a, there was a, um, a call, I guess an email sent out to kids. Anybody could come that wanted to come. And most of the kids there were juniors and seniors, I think because they can drive. And the freshmen and the sophomores that were there readily admitted that they had a ride from somebody else and that's how yeah. they could be there. So, so it was just, it was like, you know, um, wading in, dipping a toe into this big topic. Yeah, so I would just, I would just um, advocate for larger school-wide discussions. I mean, we have, we're at kind of a critical moment, I think, as many, you know, crossroads of sorts, and there, you can see this as an opportunity. And um, asking the questions that you may not be ready to hear the answers for is important, and to hear it from all of the kids, not just a select few right. who are, because, when they're self-selecting, yes. then your data is completely skewed. So you want to yes. make sure that you're listening to the entire student body, especially the younger kids. Right. Um, the other thing I would say is I would love to understand how the school is living a civic mission. And I know that you guys are all on board with this sort of a thing, but with, this, with the new law being passed that kids have to engage in some sort of civic action project by the time they graduate, how is that being um, implanted into the school? Because I hope it's, it's not just question. in the social studies classrooms, but great question. it should be embodied in every corner of the building. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's another opportunity to see student leadership outside of the normal channels. And I would, un I would expect that you guys have student government in the mm -hmm. high school, but how is that chosen? How often, um, what kind of leadership training are these kids being given? And um, you know all of that is super important. Really hard work. Thank you. And to the first part um, of your statement about being able to have these conversations with with kids, that's why my first question is: What exists? What infrastructure is there uh, to disseminate or discuss information with students? Typically, there's a homeroom or an advisory. There, are, and every school is, is different. But I, it would be good to know, um, um, you know, what is done. The other thing that occurred to me, um, and just in, in looking, listening to the kids and some of the, the comments, that, um, some of the, it wasn't. It was just observational. In the last twenty years, there have been six principals of the high school. That's not a good. Thing. Like, there's no real good transition. In the last. 20 years, there have been six superintendents in this district. So we have a problem with, I, I think, or an issue, or have to be aware of what happens when there is a change in administrative leadership. And I think, uh, typically, the, the, what, is, what sustains the culture of the school are the staff that has been there um, um, for, for many years. And then, you know, when, when new administration comes in, what happens to what the old administrator's expectations are? Are there new ones? And so, um, be inter we talk about the student's voice, but also what is the voice of the, the, the professional in school governance? How is that 
that managed? And it's not, I mean, these are not like easy questions and there are no easy answers, but I, I think that um, there is an opportunity because um, there's interest on the part of the school committee in knowing more about student voice, encouraging it, looking about how we might interact with perhaps student council, um, and we can talk about that further. I know um, Mary, unfortunately, isn't here tonight, but she <coughs> had some ideas. Um, and so we'll continue to have the conversation, um, but I, I share um, Elaine's perspective about, about the topics. I mean, after the first one, I, I had a good cry afterwards. <laughs> What's going on? And it's just, but it's every high school. There, it, in this demographic, you see the pressure, whether it's self-imposed or externally imposed. But, but there's a lot. And how are we helping them? How are we supporting them? So the good news is our focus is on social and emotional learning, which is great. But how are we using that to address some of these larger concerns? How are we even identifying the larger concerns? So um, I'm sure that we'll hear more. And it's, it's a discussion that has to be had at the high school with the folks there. Um, but you know, the one thing I do know about that school and that staff is everybody shows up every day to work in the best interest of your kids. And it is a caring environment for them. So um, Mike. Just to speak to both um, Leah's point and your point, I'm wondering if um, we could get a little bit more um, guidance on what the interface is, if any, between the school committee and students or staff. I mean, I know that there are very sharp boundaries, um, and in many ways it sort of goes against my instinct not to be available for um, kids in crisis. I mean, that's kind of what I do for a living. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you were able to attend this voice session. I'm just wondering even further, um, to what extent is the school committee um, permitted to engage at the school-wide school level with either students or staff? And if, it's, if it's, there, there is no interface, then that's how it is. But I'm just wondering if there is um, any opportunity for the school committee, which is certainly involved in tremendous levels of decision making on their behalf, um, to um, simply to engage. Well, there, there are, um, and I think going through the appropriate channels, um, these, uh, on these two instances, I was invited on the, <coughs> the, the fourth, and then when I was told there was another one on the 13th, and invited to that, I asked if I could um, bring other school committee members, and the answer was, was yes. And so I think I made most folks aware of it, and uh, Elaine was the only one that was, was able to go. Um, if you have something more specific that, that you um, have in mind, um, I guess it, it depends on, on, on what it is. Um, so. I don't know, do you have something specific that you're thinking about? I don't think it's anything specific. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, it feels like there is this, um, this barricade that exists. And maybe those, maybe those boundaries exist for a reason and maybe that's, um, maybe that's entirely appropriate. But I guess I'm just wondering if um, those barriers are as hard and fast as um, I understand them to be or if there are other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, other ways to, um, like I said, interface with kids or staff members so that they're speaking directly to the town representatives that make decisions on their behalf. Well, they can reach out to you. you they're, they're your constituents. They're our constituents. Um, the other thing that you might want to consider is having a conversation <coughs> with Dorothy Presser yeah. to set the boundaries. And, and you're in a, you and Lee are in really good positions working in a high school. What ha, what's, what's true in, in, in Lexington, in Hudson? If a school committee member wants to engage with faculty or students, what is the, the, what's the, the protocol there? I mean, that would be good to find out for mm us. -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, at the beginning of the school year, we're informed that we um, would be welcome 
to uh, have a tour of the buildings with the principal, but to go through Brooke, who goes to the principals, and then so there's that 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 protocol mm -hmm. to follow. So I mean, does that that help, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Actually, but if you think of something specific that you want to do, then you know, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, oh yes, Leah. Well, I would say that I know that in Hudson, uh, the student who sits on the school committee is elected at large and is actually kind of the tip of the spear, and so that person is responsible for engaging as a fully fledged member of the school committee. Can pose questions is, is interactive throughout the meeting so that as things come up, the student voice can be elevated at any point in time. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are ways in which the interface <coughs> can be structured, not by happenstance, by but by systems that ensure avenues for conversation that are two-way. So that's one way that we could mm -hmm. do it. I'm sure that there are many other ways. And like I said, I think that we. Uh, I know that that. Um, one of the reasons Mary felt badly not being here because she did want to speak to it a little bit. But I think that as we work through this year and set up goals for next year, this is certainly something that we can keep in mind. And if you have resources or if they have like something written up about that, it'd be good to look at. I don't know if, if there's a student in Lexington that sits on the, the school committee or not. I What I know about the school committee in Lexington is that the engagement doesn't happen nearly as often mm -hmm. as as it probably could. I think okay. that's probably true in most cases. Yeah, no, I would say, yeah. Okay, but if, as you find out things or as you think of things, yeah. um, let's let's bring them up and, and we can put them on future agendas. Um, I'm starting to think about things that, you know, we're, we have enough on our plate this year, um, but starting to think about framing goals for, um, for, for next year, so, yeah. I was going to say that as Ivy wrapped up her presentation, I frankly wanted to to lean in a little and ask her some questions yes. about you know how are things at the high school how, and so I would appreciate even in the meantime before next year mm -hmm. if we could maybe <coughs> help her or empower her to be that representative <coughs> to you know bring issues. So her report is fantastic and it's all the amazing mm -hmm. things that are happening in our mm -hmm. awesome district. Sure. But to explain to her, it doesn't always have to be the good stuff. You can also mm -hmm. bring to us things that are of concern to your student body, yeah. who you represent, and, and that we might even start posing questions of you, mm -hmm. and you know, to use that opportunity that already <coughs> exists. Yeah. The, I, I, I would love to do that. I don't know what expectations she was presented with when she took the, the job, so to speak. Was it just you just reporting on activities, or so I, I wouldn't want to put her in a position where she's uncomfortable. We certainly can find out. The other piece is that where does the so the the group that that <coughs> Elaine and I um, met with um, there was some commonalities in in the topics that they talked about, but what is going on in other areas of school? How do we know that a student who is a representative to the school committee is getting information or represents broad-based um, issues, concerns, differing points of view? So that's the challenge, I think, um, that we face, that we can talk about more how to structure it. But um, in terms of changing an expectation for Ibi, that would be something that we would have to work through um, the interim principal or the mm -hmm. substitute principal at the high school about. So maybe we could have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? I have mixed feelings about it. I, I, I worry about putting a student on the spot mm -hmm. in this particular venue that's televised to everyone. And it, it's not always easy to find somebody to come into this position to begin with. And I, I worry about that. Mm -hmm. I, I worry about, are we going to, will they feel more uncomfortable, you know. I, I just wonder if there are other avenues. Um, well, I think it yeah, begs I mean, the discussion. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah, I was just the, the spirit of the, the comment. I think is. Nice. Yes. I agree with. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think the the other thing. Um, I, I think back. I think my first year here, we had somebody who stayed for the entire meeting and did offer. So, the kind of. A, a, not the question component, but somebody that was a little bit more involved and, and um, 
felt comfortable to say his, you know, state his opinion. We didn't have that my first year right. here. Um, I, I, it's just that these last two years, I, I think that that's that hasn't happened. Um, but, but I don't think the we we went and we looked for um, the expectations for that position, and there really were none. Yeah. So I think it's worth having a conversation um, about what we would like to see in that position. <clears throat> Um, should it be someone the ele elected by the student council or the, 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 the school at large or but we can we can work out yeah. the details but I think what I hear everybody saying is that we would like to see uh, more from the student representative and it would make sense that it would get some things in place to have it and I think look, I was just going to say to that. Your, yeah. I, I was going to say, but if there's another way we can get information, um, mm -hmm. and this might the questions I pose might help us oh, yeah. like get some, yeah. Because I, I do think that if you think and plan ahead, and and the student is well prepared and is mm -hmm. that type of a student that's comfortable with that, mm -hmm. then I think I think you're okay. I think I'd be cautious to change it mid year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But no, I think when this is all. Um, stuff when we we started talking about that JIB back in the beginning of October these are all things that come up so clearly there's a lot of grist in there for us to make some goals and and work on any oh Elaine oh I was just gonna say I think historically we have not had strong systems in place for engagement between the school committee and the student body mm -hmm. um, but systems don't get put in place in an instant you know take some time to actually form them decide what they're going to be test them out and then really have that become part of um, the culture even more than the process um, so in the meantime we're kind of feeling this out maybe trying some things uh, maybe fumbling our way through it sometimes um, but from my perspective I think I would be asking the students and looking for their perspective. I mean, we, we don't know if she'd feel uncomfortable and probably mm -hmm. should ask her or see, float this idea as, does this work for you guys? Does that work for you guys? Um, like even getting invited to the PLT, it's amazing that those teachers reached out um, and invited us in. But you know, that wasn't something that was thought of months in advance. And I think at the time it was like, all right, who's available on 11 a.m. on a Friday? Like, oh, I am, you know. <laughs> well, I, I think that we had, I think, starting in October, at, at each of the meetings that we've had since October, we have, and then on November 13th and 20th, when we had students speak, we, we did say that we are looking for ways to, <coughs> to hear students' voices and to find ways yeah. to improve. So maybe that's what made them think. No, and, that, and that's great. And so some of these things are kind of yeah. happening organically. And yeah. there are, like right now, there's no hard and fast rules. I mean, I feel like sometimes we're looking for the clear yeah. guidelines um, to stay within our box. And I think this is one area where right now there kind of aren't any. Mm -hmm. And we're just feeling our way through until we can get something that we decide and the students decide works for everybody. Okay. okay. Other? Joe. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused by this yes. conversation. Um, we're talking about and you're talking about this policy issue regarding student involvement and decision making in the mm -hmm. district. Okay, uh, file JIB. Yeah. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about the mechanics of it, and am, am I am I missing something here? It, it seems to me that the legislature and their infinite <coughs> wisdom has already defined the, the parameters as how this is supposed to be implemented under Section 38M of Chapter 71. Mm -hmm. And. I, I want to say this. I, I couldn't agree more with the superintendent. I, I feel that the way that this, this particular statute was crafted, it states here that, that there is supposed to be a student rep from a student, uh, at the, at the, the chair of the student advisory committee that attends our meetings on an every other month basis. Mm -hmm. And that the statute says that they're ex officio without voting rights, but they can attend executive sessions if, in, if it's appropriate. Right. So I did spend a lot of time talking about that with Dorothy. Right. And her and, and she goes back and she looks at what other school districts are doing and talks to other field reps. Right. Um, she's not aware that anyone is following this to the letter of the law, but it people in some districts are doing something that meets the spirit of the law right. and then people in other districts are not doing it at all. With that being said, mm -hmm. From my perspective, given the fact that, and I, I couldn't, I, I would tend to embrace what Dorothy has said about the fact that many, if not most, school districts in the Commonwealth 
do not adhere to the statute, the letter. to the letter of the statute, that perhaps the statute is ripe for repeal. And that by doing so well. Oh, no, I'm just laughing. I'm not ready to take that on, but. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my legislator. But, 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 you know, I've heard, I've been sitting here listening to what, you know, the contributions of each member, and they're saying, well, we should do this, we should do that. But to me, the law says what we have to do. And if nobody's following the law, I don't, I don't want to color it that way, if many districts are not embracing the full letter of the law, mm -hmm. maybe this, this particular provision should be either repealed or amended. But I think by appealing it, it then gives the district freedom to do exactly what they want, how they want to do it, put the parameters on it that we think are appropriate for our students and what have you. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I just it just seems to me we're talking about you know how breaking you breaking the law, <laughs> and enhancing the law. No, we're not following. It. We're not following it to the letter. No, well, yeah. a, there are a lot of statutes that you know are are still law in the Commonwealth that are not followed. I mean, there, I won't mention any, but there are <laughs> quite a few of them out there that, um, you know, that, that will make your eyes you know, eyebrows raise a little bit. But to me, it, I couldn't agree more with the superintendent. I do think that putting a student in this position, you know, on local cable access, mm -hmm. and then I, I'd love to know if there's any district in the Commonwealth that actually gives a student the right to attend an executive session. So I, I just, I'm just throwing that out for consideration that maybe yeah. it's a, a call to a legislator and say, look, take a look at 38M and, and make a decision whether or not this should be you know, still uh, considered the law of the mind. So. Mm -hmm. No, well, thank you. And I think we'll have a larger conversation. This will be an agenda item at some point where we really um, um, pull it apart and decide what we want to do. But I think, would, would it be me that calls the legislature and says, this is a dumb law from 1994. Feel free to. I got it. I'm going to put on my list of things to do. No, but thank you. But I, you know what? I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a lawyer. I don't even play one on TV. But I don't have a problem not following a law that I think is stupid. Look, I, I, with all due respect, Benji, I, I don't think it's really on you. I mean, I think it's on any of us that are, that are sitting here. No, but I'm all the chair. Power, but, I get to do yeah. all the fun stuff. Well, there. really, but I, but I don't want to put this on you. I mean, I would be happy to call the state, like my state legislature, and say, look, mm -hmm. nobody seems to be adhering to 38M. Mm -hmm. So why don't we look at this thing and, and see if there's something we can do? Because I think our district would feel better about being able to provide the, our own parameters mm -hmm. for a student voice on the district committee, as opposed <coughs> to having to, to follow this particular one. So are you, are you volunteering to I'll do it? I'll be happy to do it. Because I think you'd come across a lot better than me talking to somebody about that, if you don't mind. I'll be happy to do it. I'll I'd be happy, happy to, to let you do I'll it. I'll be happy to contact you. Right. If, if that's what you think it... Oh, I'd love to know what they say, what the person says. What's 38M? That's that law. That would, no, oh, I, that's that what they're going to say. That would be a legislator's first question. My point exactly. Yes. What is 38M? Yeah. My point exactly. Go take a look at it, and maybe okay. you want to bring it before the general court and say, right. listen, this is right for appeal. Okay. Thank you. I'll take care of it. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Very good. All right. Now we are off to the superintendent's report. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of us were uh, fortunate to go into Boston um, Wednesday morning. There were nine of us. There were nine of us, nine of us in our traveling caravan that morning. Um, and of the school committee, um, Elaine was there, Kathy was there, and, and Stu Firmenstein as we, we got the phone call to, to go into to Boston to the MSBA um, meeting. Uh, we had, they called us on um, Monday and uh, <coughs> chatted with us, uh, I believe on Tuesday as well about what we could expect and you know and if our name that our names were being put forward um, uh, um, but until a vote had actually happened not to plan anything uh, you know but if a vote happened our names were on there then we would be um, invited to stay for the orientation meeting so the vote did happen we spoke um, uh, to, to thank the MSPA for even putting us on that list of 11 there were only 11 schools uh, that were were moved forward we were one of those 11 and I, I just couldn't have been I, I just couldn't have been prouder I know that I'm going to talk a little bit more um, uh, in this meeting about some of the specifics but I was so proud of the fact that our SOI had gotten us uh, that far. I was so proud of the, the former school committee members that, that nudged us forward, that supported the submission, not once but twice of this SOI to get us uh, mm -hmm. to this point. And even the fact that so many of us, 
and all of you that could make it that morning on a very I gotta say that was a difficult morning because that was also a delayed start mm -hmm. and we were all standing out here at about quarter after six that morning getting ready to head into Boston mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm just so pleased that 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 we are where we're at. So we want to thank MSB8 for recognizing the sense of urgency and our need at Neshoba Regional High School in terms of the facility. Um, so we've been invited to the eligibility period. I'll, I'll just um, mention a little bit in greater detail when we get to that section of the meeting. Um, and we're just so appreciative of this opportunity. I was hoping that we would get a little bit further than we got last last year. Um, I never for once, and I think I've even kind of said that around the table, never thought we would get that close yeah. like we did and it was just mm -hmm. I, I know that we went to the orientation meeting and I think I said to Kathy I just want to sit and cry now <laughs> because it was just like so much like there's a lot of work that goes into this and they hit that point so uh, so great so grateful to past school committee members and uh, everybody who was involved our team that helped to, to pull that SOI together so I just want to piggyback on something that you were saying about um, past members of the school committee because this actually started uh, many years ago uh, long with before a space I got here. task force That's and right. I know that Lorraine Ramosco and Lynn Coletti were on that space task force. I think Mark Jones was And well. uh, Mark Jones as well and then in terms of when we started to work on the SOI, Lorraine and Lynn and um, Neil Darcy spent a lot of time looking at it and giving input to it. Um, so I do, I think it's important to recognize the all the work that came before, and also um, when you took this job, you walked right into this, and you took the ball and and ran with it. Yeah. And I think we only got it so you would stop bothering Diane Sullivan, yeah. <laughs> who was uh, a number of times. Every time something <laughs> big went wrong at that high school, I was on the phone to MSB right, right away. So it's been a, a long we time. I know we've, yeah. we've got a long way to go, but we're here because <clears> of, <throat> of the work of a lot of, uh, people. A lot of people. So. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Aspen Valley Collaborative, we have to report out um, a couple of times a year and you've got the school committee update in your package. So I just encourage you to take a quick peek at that at, um, at your convenience. Um, the budget, Kathy and I talked about this earlier and I know that I had the same discussion with Steve. Um, past school committee members have, have asked for the full budget, like every single request that's come through and that kind of thing for the month of December. and. In some ways, I, I certainly am respectful of that. In other ways, um, it, re, what it really did was put all kinds of numbers, false numbers out there because then it, it's not a budget that we can live with. We right. all know that. Mm -hmm. And so then we have to sit back down thereafter and start pairing back and say, okay, what's reasonable, what makes sense? So this year we, we come to a kind of a collective decision that, you know what, we're gonna wait until January until the number is really much closer to the realistic number of what it's going to be. Um, so we already know from talking to our town administrators the ballpark of where that number should be at. So we kind of already have a flavor of where we're going to be gunning for uh, mm -hmm. in January and February. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's kind of where that sits right now. The differential right now is just far too big to even even discuss right now. So we have to go back now and, and start to uh, pair it back. <coughs> uh, the other thing is I, I put a little note here, just special thanks to our parents. And I think it really struck me the night that I was watching the symphonic band uh, perform in the the mall in the Solomon Pond Mall and I was I was thinking I, I put a little note here you know we, we always tend to reflect on things that fill us with gratitude at this time of year and and I was standing there that night thinking how grateful I am uh, to, to work in a community that so supports its children, mm -hmm. so supports its education, and I, as as I st the the way that it was set up that night was uh, it was just outside of the J C Penney um, doors. I thought I might do some shopping that night. However, I did not do any shopping. <laughs> I just stood and listened because it was just so incredible. And of course, you're on the top floor looking down, and so you see like. I swear there's like 200 of them. It's, I mean, it's a big group. If you've not heard that symphonic band, it's a huge group of people. And you've got you've got our students in there, all with our, you know, the Neshoba brand, you know, that they're wearing, and um, and all these adults and, and teachers. And I mean, it's a big group. Honestly, I think it is about 115 people, 125 people. It's a big group. And then the, the, just the texture of the music that night was just so, it was magnificent. <clears throat> but what struck me was the, the parents that were just surround, like surrounding, they, all this love that you could feel going into that group. And we see the same thing whether we're at football games or volleyball games or whatever. And just, so 
you know, just this is just a note to say how much I acknowledge the parents that we've got in our communities, and we just have tremendous parents. I, I think that I, I put a note here, our parents are a key reason as to why this district is so successful, and I, I feel that so strongly. So special thanks to all of our parents. And Dr. McGuire, we'll turn it sure. over to you. Last piece is around uh, kind of an update on social emotional learning as it relates to professional development. As you'll know, within our district improvement plan, the two year district improvement plan, this year we're really focused on educating um, our professional staff so that we can have a solid implementation plans with students next year. Um, so we've got several social emotional learning teams um, that attended a third session at our S3 Academy that's tied to the Ready Center in Boston College and, uh, last Thursday. And they also attended the second session of the Excel Network on Monday. You'll, re you'll remember that these are two major grants that we got around social emotional learning in the district. And we have several teams from all of our schools participating. Um, with the Excel Network, the focus was on building relationships with our social emotional teams and within our schools. Uh, one of the major goals for the year is to really develop a district-wide vision for social emotional learning. It's develop the vision first before there's any sort of implementation. Um, and at this, at this meeting last week, they created what was called an asset map, and the team learned that enough, already learned and identified a number of positive social emotional learning related efforts that are already in place at Neshoba. So it's really determining what we already have in place and looking forward as to what, we, what our needs are moving forward. So as we move forward with our district improvement plan and our goal of integrating social emotional learning with academics, uh, we are capitalizing on the efforts that are already ongoing in the district. Um, in this spring, we will bring in consultants from the S3 Academy, and we have consultants at the S3 Academy that have been identified that are working specifically with Neshoba, and they'll be visiting in the spring at each site to offer feedback um, with the plans that we're putting in place. So a lot going on around uh, SEL and professional development with staff uh, to prepare for implementation with kiddos next year. And I see that Alita's found um, Ibby's report in here. Uh, I just thought the pictures were just so positive. There are MRE kindergartners uh, making their gingerbread houses. And uh, the LBMS, I, I know I very often will do a retweet on Thursdays because they, they do these incredible positive sign Thursdays. Um, and so very often I'll retweet some of the pictures that, that they, uh, they put out on Twitter on Thursdays. So I just love the pictures. I thought they were just awesome. So and I love that Ibby includes them yeah. with her with her work. So that's so that's it for us. Okay. Any Thanks, questions Alina. for Brooke and Todd? Okay, let's move on to new business. Teaching and learning department visioning. Great. Um, <clears throat> I'll start this year. We're gonna bring up uh, Martina Kenyon, who's our district K to twelve curriculum coordinator and Kim Early, who is not only the high school uh, department head for English, she is also our new secondary humanities lead. As you remember, this, this year we uh, kind of created and morphed this position for, for Kim so that she could really be a strong liaison between the schools and uh, the district central office and the teaching and learning department. So they're here to talk a little bit about our vision moving forward in the teaching and learning department for the district. Um, so we've spent some time in the teaching and learning department all year really crafting what we believe the mission is for the teaching and learning department and for teaching and learning across the district. Um, so Martina is going to give a little overview of um, what that mission is and how we kind of uh, brainstormed and crafted that with several people in the department. Um, we also have kind of a vision moving forward. Um, this secondary humanities lead position has been instrumental this year in terms of Kim doing work with our secondary humanities folks, particularly our social studies folks with the new social studies frameworks that have come down. Leah, you spoke about the civics, the important component of civics that are coming down, and Kim's doing a tremendous amount of work with our secondary social studies teachers. Um, and Kim is also gonna talk a little bit about her role and what she has been doing in that role. Um, and we wanna talk a little bit about our vision moving forward um, to incorporate more kinds of roles like this in several different disciplines across the district so that we can have those um, liaisons between our teaching and learning department at Central Office as well as within our schools. Um, so I'm going to kind of hand it over to Martina and Kim and they're going to talk a little bit about uh, the vision moving forward and a lot about uh, the work that we've been doing this year with this new position. So awesome. thank you ladies. Thanks. Uh, so we're very excited and thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you tonight. I think we're most excited to present um, this de uh, department revisioning because we do feel like it's going to 
uh, give us an opportunity as a district to really um, make a significant step forward in some of the shifts in curriculum and instruction that um, we hope will continue to meet the uh, newer student uh, expectations for student learning. So thanks again for the chance. Um, as you know, the Department of Teaching and Learning's primary focus is really to support um, educators, teachers, and administrators um, as we make changes both related to the district vision and state initiatives. Uh, we facilitate these changes mainly through professional development and curriculum development opportunities that, are, um, that uh, involve teachers and other educators from throughout the district. Um, but our, our vision and our um, approach to education is changing as a district, and I think we've all kind of been exploring that as a, a group for a while. I've presented here a number of times um, before about the need to pre prepare students for a world that requires them to work and think critically and flexibly, to navigate a world of information, and to collaboratively make decisions that have a positive impact both on themselves and uh, the community. <coughs> and as a department, we've really been doing a lot of thinking about um, how we can best help all educators in the district to meet um, these student needs by ensuring that um, the educators have access to current research and also um, that they can be supportive, supported uh, to employ instruction, innovative instructional practices that model for students the type of thinking and learning that we really want them to do. Um, this After this year, we also have a retirement in the department, and so that presents us an opportunity to kind of rethink the structure, um, and we feel like it's a good time to do that, to both be able to um, promote our outstanding educators continual growth and also to more fully integrate areas that we've been talking about such as social emotional learning digital learning and also literacy which is obviously an ongoing need for um, for all students um, and we also still want to continue to benefit from the cross um, content support models that we already have so after much consideration, we really feel that the best way and the best structure for the department in order to meet all these needs is to have content um, area leads who can prevent, present um, content-specific insight um, while at the same time helping um, to coach teachers on really integrating areas like digital literacy, um, social-emotional learning, and um, other forms of literacy. So the structure that you see in your presentation here um, is the proposed structure for the Department of Teaching and Learning. Um, there would be a teaching and learning coordinator who oversees the work of four uh, curriculum leads. Those four leads are an elementary humanities lead, a secondary humanities lead, uh, a district math lead, a district science technology engineering lead, and would also um, oversee the part-time work and collaboration with our middle school ITS who um, are part of our department on a part-time basis. Um, specifically, the curriculum leads, we see their um, major focus to be um, providing coaching within schools around cutting edge and effective instructional practices, um, curriculum development, and also coaching around um, using our um, formal and informal assessment data to <coughs> inform instruction. Um, they'd be uh, able to stay current on best practices within their content areas and um, bring back learning from content-specific networks across the state. Um, they would also provide knowledge and oversight of <coughs> technology tools and digital learning expectations, um, specific, specifically supporting their um, content areas and the content area practice expectations um, that exist for students. These individuals would also um, provide coaching and guidance for teachers to support areas like literacy and social-emotional learning with a specific eye on the connection for how those um, integrated areas support the content area learning. And finally, because these people would be um, have a major presence across the schools, um, they would really be able to facilitate the sharing of innovative practices across and within schools. <coughs> Uh, that may feel, sound like a lot of expertise for a single individual to have, um, but we feel that it is the best way to really support the integration of um, areas in which we've been pushing for integration for so long, in including um, digital learning and social-emotional learning. Um, we feel that someone who understands deeply the connection between these practices and the practices in the context-specific <coughs> practices that exist um, we can best support our teachers to be able to make shifts to um, supporting students in these areas. 
we also think that the structure will um, help our help us um, be more flexible in achieving our um, any additional district-wide goals that we establish in the future. Uh, in uh, developing these roles, we also see this as an opportunity to develop our teacher leaders within the district. We're re really looking at this um, as a way to further develop our exemplary teachers. We see this as um, some in an intensive opportunity for teachers to grow further and have another avenue for growth um, within our district. And we piloted some aspects of this role with our secondary humanities lead, Kim Early, who's gonna talk a little bit more in a moment um, about her work, but we feel that um, it's been a good example for how we can kind of bring a teacher with, into the department and really um, leverage that in district expertise. So. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that we'll, we are looking forward to the continued part-time work of our middle school ITS within the department. Um, they're going to actually talk in a little bit, uh, but they will continue to play a vital role um, in this reorganization in terms of finding, managing, and supporting the implementation of cross-curricular technology tools within the district. They're also going to continue to provide another layer of technology-related expertise to members of our department. Um, and then one of the risks, of course, in moving toward a model that's separated by content area is the creation of silos. We've talked about that a lot here in the school committee, too. And um, because they create sometimes limited awareness or coordination of the overlapping expectations of students, uh, and that's really going to be a major role of the teaching and learning coordinator, um, is to really facilitate the connections across content areas um, to develop or to establish um, consistency in the vision and also execution of cross-curricular efforts, including social-emotional learning and digital learning. Um, that person will also stay current on statewide changes and initiatives and guide the work of the four content leads. Um, so now Kim's going to talk a little bit uh, in a little more detail as far as the work she's done this year, and we're, we're hoping that that will provide you a little sampling of the type of work that a curriculum lead would do in the future. Before Kim talks about the specific um, components of her work. I also want to mention that um, you're aware that we have teaching and learning meetings with our principals and our district principals um, at least once a month and they have been an integral part too of this vision moving forward. So this vision <coughs> was crafted um, in concert with our building leaders um, because they're obviously working in concert with Martina, myself, and Kim in their buildings and the work that's going on and so between the teaching and learning department as well as our, our building leaders, um, they've been part of and very supportive of this new structure and the work that is going on in this capacity, as well as this is the second year we're working with um, our, our ITS gentlemen in the back of the room, so. Leanne, is it time to ask a quick question about structure? Um, can we get through the whole thing? Yes, yeah, thank you. So first, I'd like to thank Brooke and Todd and Martina and Cindy for all the support as I start this new role. Um, as a veteran teacher, this is such an exciting opportunity to me to grow in a way that's in addition to the work I was doing in the classroom. So I thought I would share with you today some of the details of what we've been doing this year so you can see sort of how we can put this into play and impact student learning um, as a result. So. The first is to, to take a look at um, facilitating a curriculum development. And so within our history departments, we have new standards that have come out. And so that, that group six to eight, as well as the high school, have been working on unpacking those so that we can look both at the content standards as well as the practice standards. and. For example, in our sixth to seventh grade, our teachers had new units that they have never taught before. And so as <coughs> part of my role is to support them, in how do I find resources? How do I find the knowledge? How do I um, implement new practices using content that I've never covered before? And so we created a, a collaboration with pr Primary Source, and they came in and taught us We've had two opportunities to work with the sixth and seventh grade team, and the first was to work with um, a group from Primary Source that talked about Ghana and Mali and worked on 
trade in that area. So we focused on a theme that um, instead of trying to cover all of sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at it thematically to dive in, dig deep, and really try to cover a particular theme within that area. And so we saw a primary source brought in articles <coughs> that we could touch. There was a huge um, camo bag that we were able to see that we could use with students and borrow. And they brought novels to share with us about Timbuktu. So we would incorporate literacy into our history class as well so that we would meet those practice standards. Um, so we had a great day of learning. And then we spent the afternoon <coughs> writing curriculum to then support and um, implement that information that we learned in, in the morning. So um, that was an awesome opportunity for us. And um, we continue then in eighth grade to work with our civics curriculum, as well as implement this year a civics project that you spoke of earlier. And at the high school, <coughs> we also are working to unpack their standards as well as implement a civics project in 11th grade. And we have talked about how we would like other departments to support that work because it is a large task for a, a teacher in a classroom. But how can we work across curriculum with um, English and um, maybe a science class, et cetera. Um, another area that we have been working on is trying to promote a growth mindset for our teachers. <coughs> and I think this role is a large piece of how we can support teachers in this area. In that, I think we have to become comfortable enough and build relationships with the teachers to be able to go in, observe, offer feedback, share resources, and be open to um, having conversations that will help impact uh, the work that they do. So in um, English, we've worked with TLA. A TLA consultant has come in to work with six to eight in the literacy work we've <coughs> been doing. So as you know, in K-5, we've had a nice rollout of literacy workshop. We are now working to implement that in 6 to 8, as well as working on that in 9 to 12 in high school. So our hope is to support teachers in trying to implement the workshop model in 6 to 8th grade, so that we then have a continuum of students who have experienced this very individualized instruction in reading and writing and literacy <coughs> skills. Um, so in addition to, um, Todd had talked about the uh, attending our teaching and learning meetings with principals, um, the collaboration piece across the district is essential to this role because we have three towns. We have sixth grade teacher in one school, a sixth grade teacher and a sixth grade teacher. So to bring those together, I think that's super important that they sit down and uh, are able to co collaborate. Um, in addition, we also attend vertical meetings so that 6th, 7th, and 8th, we're looking <coughs> at um, skills and progression as well. And so we're hoping that those pieces will help support teachers so that they're able to uh, continue to do what they do well and to revise as new techniques and new strategies and new material comes forward and that's going to lead to practice that's going to help impact student learning, um, which is sort of always the goal. Right? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. <coughs> um, Leah, did you have a question? <coughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to ask about the structure. So I noticed that um, the humanities it, well, social studies and English have been combined and called humanities. And so instead of having an English K-12 <coughs> and a social studies K-12, you've combined them. So I was just wondering what the thinking was behind that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we really um, had a lot of diff many different iterations of this to really figure out what the best, most effective way to um, address the varying needs of the content area. 
um, is, and I think particularly with um, ELA and social studies, um, there's so much overlap opportunity and so much um, interdisciplinary opportunity there um, that we really wanted to have uh, positions that leverage that, and um, Kim has kind of helped us test that out this year. <coughs> and, it. and what we've seen is that um, we really are able to, I think, enhance the learning in both areas in attempting to bring um, the literacy elements into um, like inquiry type work in history social studies and conversely um, allowing some of the um, history social studies component to overflow into ELA adding some context some for different context to that learning um, and so that was kind of how we landed at, at the humanities um, type role for so do you think that the curriculum <coughs> as you guys are mapping the curriculum as it you know you're going to grow it up with the new standards do you think that there's going to be some very planned connections across the two disciplines yes whereas when the students are studying ancient history <coughs> some of the yes literature they're looking at or yes I mean that that's the absolute vision and, um, and do you our, want to share a the bit? history practice standards <coughs> now contain things that say argue um, it, it specifically spells out literacy skills that students are going to have to use as they approach their inquiry in history. Mm -hmm. So um, reading primary and secondary sources. Mm -hmm. We need to also support students in that. And so teaching how to read those like a historian, I think is essential for them. And we think that that's a really important aspect <coughs> of this role too is um, often we expect students to just possess these skills in different content areas, mm -hmm. maybe aside from um, ELA, and that's really just not true. We have to teach them. We have to explicitly teach them. And so I think having an integration of that form allows us as a department to, to support um, teachers, teachers to develop the skills to teach those, um, those practices, I guess I'll call it as well. Other questions? Mike. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, I wonder if world language is sort of distinct enough where it does not have a lead or if that's mm -hmm. grouped into the humanities? Uh, that's uh, still to be discussed, but in the current model it's grouped into the humanities. Okay. Um, Kim, right? Um, you talked about these vertical meetings mm -hmm. um, in a district that is regional because <coughs> we have multiple elementary schools, we have multiple middle schools, and then we sort of converge and funnel kids into a single high school. And so I wonder if some of those meetings include a visitation of this spiraling curriculum um, and so that there is, um, I, I guess, consistency within which the content is delivered at each level so that as we get to the high school, there's not a disparity between some kids from some towns and others from other towns. I would definitely think that's a primary goal. I definitely have that as a goal in the back of my head as to being a teacher at the high school for 20 years. I think it's important for us at times we have met as an English group 6 to 12 and that's important for us to have that vertical discussion. Um, as well as sometimes a ninth grade group going to an eighth grade class to see that happen, that it's a, a continuum. And that's particularly in the literacy work we've been doing. By starting K to five and building our way up, we want kids to be used to the workshop model and to build on those skills throughout so that by the time they get to high school, they all have the same experience and it's not one particular school that is doing very well. Other questions? I have a couple. I have a comment, but, but you can ask a question. Well, thanks. Um, I, I, you mentioned the growth mindset. It would be great if you could come back and do a presentation on that and implications for teaching and learning because it is, I don't know how many people around the table are aware of it, but it is just tremendously significant in terms of the implications, um, not just for, for learning, um, but for, for self-regulation, all sorts of things. So it's huge. And if you, it's, um, 
based on the work of Carol Dweck. It's an easy read, um, and it's called um, Mindset. Um, so anyway, if you want to pick it up and read it, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And we, when I was in Concord, that was the book that everybody had to read. Um, and we talked about it. It was just phenomenal. So it would be good to come back and talk more about it so the committee can understand um, more about um, just what a great concept it is and how valuable it is um, in all areas of life. Uh, the other question I have is with regard to, I can see that um, um, the, the breakdown in the, in the structure. Um, and what is the relationship then between department heads at the high school and this um, this proposed structure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in my role, I um, had frequent meetings with all the <coughs> content chairs, and so that um, work would be done by the four content area leads, at mm -hmm. least for those, con those content areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the the role we see is partnership, I guess, at this point, where um, these individuals would really be available to provide direct coaching support for um, individuals within the departments, <coughs> but would also work in collaboration with the department chairs to establish kind of the areas of focus mm -hmm. and um, to, to work with them collectively to um, determine really uh, areas of need for members of the department. And then one last thing. Um, I'm glad you asked the question about world language, um, Mike, because I was wondering about that too. So that <coughs> begs the question for me about related arts. Um, is there a um, someone who leads those? Um, could you speak a little bit about that in this this proposed structure? Yep. So we did. I didn't include it in this um, model because it's not. It doesn't have a staffing impl implication. Mm -hmm. um, but we are intending to have. Um, point people for each of the content areas, mm -hmm. um, including the related arts, um, through uh, what we're calling a curriculum committee lead or a curriculum task force. And those people would um, be point people for curriculum change in those areas as well. But they're not positions. Okay. Thank you. Other, oh, Leah. So um, if it were to me, I would put every dollar that we have on this. Right, the future of our children are in your hands. <laughs> um, but I no pressure, no pressure. I think I you all know though. Um, it's so, so important. Um, I wonder if these leads will be internal. It, like you said, promoting teacher leaders, and I wonder if they will still be teaching classes, or will they be full time administrators with evaluation potential um, and you know, secondary to that question, of course, is what, and I don't know, maybe this is not the time to ask, but there's obviously a budget implication here. So um, this, if you're, if you're keeping department heads and adding these leads, it seems like, like that's another pretty large layer that I believe is super important, but I just need to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the intent is to, um, wherever possible and interest is available, um, to, have these um, spots be filled by people within the, the school district. Um, and I think whether they become full-time or not will depend on the people who apply and how we're kind of able to work those, mm -hmm. those roles out. But not evaluatory. At this time, no, they're no. not intended to no, be no. expected to be evaluatory. And Leah, when we do the budget, you'll see um, for each school and for the, each department, if there are requests for additional staffing and so that's the point at which we can ask questions and see what the impact, if there is an impact, or what it's going to be. Sometimes there's just attrition <coughs> and something is added, but because, um, like they talked about a retirement, um, and so you, the, the, the Brooke and her team will look at the big picture and move the pieces around, but we'll see it when we get the budget book and what's going to be added, and we'll know um, if there are trade-offs, if there are um, add-ons, so if, it'll be at that time that we can really take a look. Right now, this we're, we're planning for this to be a wash, for in terms of monetary. So because we've got the one that one retirement, and so this is just a completely different, fresh look at that unit, because we won't be replacing that retirement. So if you can think of it that way, as being a wash in these positions here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you have more questions? So I know I've asked this question before, and I think I stepped outside of my purview by asking it, but I just, as a teacher myself, every time I hear you say, 
by reducing a staff position, I feel my class sizes get larger. So I think maybe I'm outside of my purview. But, um, no, it's not, it's not necessarily outside of your purview, but that, no, that this has absolutely nothing to do with that at all. Like, okay. absolutely nothing. Okay. Yeah. And when we get the budget book, we'll see the class sizes. And we, we generally, uh, yeah. through the process, we generally give you a, a, an idea of class sizes right across the district. Mm -hmm. You know, and teachers can be asked to do all kinds of amazing things, but if they're burdened by you know 30 students in their classroom no no no, no that's no, not no, gonna that's, that's not, that absolutely not gonna this happen. plan has been in motion for quite some time and knowing what, what what has been coming down the pike in terms of a retirement in terms of what way the way we shifted kim into that which is why this year we piloted just kim mm -hmm. right. to see the effectiveness and also to see how it would fit in as well as but from a budget perspective um and it's and, and I would say, really, it started with our gentleman at the back. And it started with, because yeah, this is year know, two for them. This is year two for them. Exactly. And, and I remember they, they really were the guinea pigs and right. such, you know, You're and right. said, okay, let's see if this if this, this yeah. can fly. And we've got this little idea. And, and, the, and there was no monetary uh, change there at all, right? It, we, we were able to work with the principals and... and um, I'm I'm so pleased with where we we're, we're landed, and so then when we got the idea to take it one next level this year, and Kim, I just want to say thank you. I just want to thank you so much for, because really I, I I know when you came back and you met with us a couple of times saying, is this exactly what it's going to look like as we were trying to flush out the details? Because even with with Greg and Gary, it was like, okay, we're going to try this. We're going to see how this is going to work, and then if it works really well, we're going to try to replicate it. And then we felt comfortable in going to that next position and say, okay, this worked well. We're ready to try it one more. What you're seeing now is, okay, this is working so well. We're going to try this a little bit differently. So rather than replacing that one person with that one salary, we're going to look at kind of breaking that apart and doing something differently. It also falls, I mean, I remember talking to Kevin Keeveny two years ago or three years ago when I first started thinking about this. and and. The thinking that, that for my personal thinking at that point in time was just I think teachers come sometimes learn so well from other teachers you know I, and that's really what you have and you know I, I mean and I go back to the the, the 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 tech tasting you know and all that like some of the fun things really cool things that you guys have done back there I mean it just such a gift and and it came you you brought in that whole excitement was it Kate Roberts and, and all of that that came that you brought forward and then this beautiful natural tie-in but you'd already been doing some of that before we even came forward and say and we said hey we've got this idea and so you were able to take all of that and, and kind of nurture that a little bit differently I mean you brought her back in again this year because I, I was there I saw that uh, taking place but it's so exciting because you were able to tie in the the elementary the, the five year plan that we've been on that we're just coming to the end of that where it's all and and gets back to Mike and we've said this all the way along like we're looking at continuity across the district and that's one of the reasons we we went with the literacy plan the way that we did so that everybody was talking the same language same vocab same you know same. Um, same so many things uh, approach to teaching the, the approach to the instruction and and, uh, and I also want to say I want to go back to Kevin when I first brought it forward with Kevin too and I, I said you know we're gonna try this like let's just see how it works and I so I want to acknowledge the support of the union at that point in time to, to think a little bit differently so I think what you're saying now is us ready to take life to that next level and I'm very excited about it and I think it's just great for our teachers it's great for our kids mm -hmm. so I'm I'm thrilled to see and as Todd had said uh, I think so eloquently what this was not just one or two people sitting down talking about this mm -hmm. this is a large collection of people that sat down and did some very rich discussion not just one or two meetings worth like mm -hmm. lots of meetings worth to where we've landed so we feel very comfortable in putting this forward tonight so uh, yeah I'm really excited about this. Like this is the work that I've done in the past, and like I am so I am so proud of this entire teaching and learning department Me for too. the work that they are doing, and as well as to see the excitement that I see in Kim on a daily basis with this work because I always check in with her pretty regularly. Uh, but this district also is afforded tremendous resources, and I've been in a number of districts to see the amount of resources that you <coughs> folks support. And what we are trying to do is create those positions internally to deliver and make those deliverables to our teachers and our kiddos, and we're able to do that here. 
Um, so that, I've never seen more support for, for curricular resources in a district that I have here, and we're able to do that. And what Kim and Martina and the RITS gentlemen are doing is fantastic. Yeah. So thank so you. So proud. Um, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank um, you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, you forward to more reports. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, technology update. So this is an interesting, if you take a look at the, who's coming to the table tonight. So we, we have uh, Greg, Gary, and, and G's are going to be more of the resource over there, but we're really talking about the teaching and learning component tonight. So um, Dr. why we have you kick this yes. off as well? So um, <coughs> we're excited to kind of do the teaching and learning visioning for you and then also kind of bring the work that's tied to that. Similar tonight when we've done a digital learning or a technology update, oftentimes we've had Suchi come and kind of give Come the, the semantics or the specifics around technology. So we're gonna do a little bit of that, but we also thought it was a tremendous opportunity to bring our technology integration specialists, uh, Greg and Gary, uh, to the table here to talk a lot about uh, the work that they've been doing over the past two years. They work uh, in our central office and in the teaching and learning department two days a week, two days out of the cycle, A and B days, and they come over and they work together in concert with uh, sometimes myself, Cindy Larson, our director of uh, uh, digital learning, uh, Suchi, uh, and they also work in concert with our schools, our building principals, all of our teachers. Uh, they are in buildings, they are overseeing technology tastings, coaching. Uh, coaching. We send them out sometimes to go to other schools or do outreach to see what other schools are doing, uh, mass Q conference, those kinds of things so that they can bring back those rich ideas and help implement uh, you know, best practices as they relate to and overlap with digital learning curriculum standards in the classroom um, across several disciplines. So they're here tonight to talk a little bit about um, some of the work they've been doing. Um, they <coughs> oversaw and created our digital safety uh, information night this fall for our parents over at Florence Sawyer. Um, they're also gonna talk a little bit about the Learn platform, which I've talked about um, a couple of times. It's a new digital tool that helps us vet resources and applications that all teachers can use and get information on kind of best practices in that digital world. Um, they're going to talk about their roles as ITS in teaching and learning. Um, they'll talk a little bit about digital safety and privacy. And then uh, Suchi's going to update us on our kind of Chromebook evergreening because we're now in a place where we've equipped all students 6 through 12 with their own Chromebook. Um, and that's going extremely well. Um, and it's been streamlined and I think um, uh, pretty much forward moving. So I'm gonna hand it over to these guys. Yeah, and I think, I think too, just let them know, like we're focusing tonight on teaching and learning, but right. they need to know that the other, the other days when you're not here, you're in a building. Right. So they yeah. wouldn't know necessarily what building you're in, what, what the teaching okay. is that you do. Yeah, so, so introduce I, yourselves, please. I teach in, I teach in <coughs> Burbank Middle School. I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I have my own classes for in, integrating technology in sixth and seventh grade. Um, and I also try to integrate into the regular classes as much as possible as well. Um, I don't have eighth grade class, but I also integrate into the classes too. Um, and then as Todd said on A and B days, I'm here with Gary and we kind of try to you know, coordinate our curriculum that we're bringing back to the <coughs> if we're talking about our own curriculum or there are days where we go out to other schools, other conferences, and we kind of collaborate together what we can bring back to our teachers or to administration, we, we help a lot with um, staff meetings. And yeah, you mm -hmm. heard the tech tastings and things like that that we kind of came up with of, of sharing what we've seen outside district, bringing back the innovative teaching that we've seen outside district. And again, I, I might goes back to your question <coughs> earlier too about the fact that we're, we're trying again that le level of continuity and consistency across the district. And that's a, a big piece of their role as, as well. I'm at the Florence Sawyer School, and uh, I also teach six through eight, and I have uh, six grade classes once a cycle. I see every sixth grader, I see every seventh grader uh, once a cycle, and the eighth grade, I've kind of gotten my way in to seeing every eighth grader every other cycle. Um, so some of the things that we do, uh, we just finished uh, coding, and we introduce uh, different apps that teachers might use in the classroom, and we teach the kids how to use it before the teachers uh, that way we don't have to be there when the teacher introduces something new, so it works out really well. I uh, would like to thank uh, Brooke and Todd for giving us the opportunity to do this, and we'd like to thank you for inviting us. Yeah, so many nice things have been said about us, you know, if, if I... You can go. I, I can get your number and you know, give it to my wife whenever I'm in the doghouse. 
tis the season. <laughs> so uh, one thing that we're doing, we're working really closely with, with Cindy uh, Larson on this on Learn Platform. Um, it, what works really well is that we're able to vet products and we're able to look at everything that we're using. There's a lot that we use district-wide and we're able to put things head to head and find out what we're paying for and what other people are using that might be free that could replace it and also look at umbrella products that could incorporate a number of these things so we can save money that way. Um, it does a really nice job. Um, what teachers can do down the road once we roll it out is an eighth grade science teacher could go on there and put whatever they're, they're teaching on any given day and find uh, resources that they can use in their classroom, whether it's virtual, virtual dissection or uh, a number of other things. Uh, they can find resources that us as, as a school has vetted and uh, would work for them, or they can look on the whole Learn platform and what our community um, has looked at and what other teachers uh, are using. Yeah, so it's kind of our goal that <coughs> teachers will look into our community and our apps first and see you know, how we've graded or how we've evaluated those tools and see, oh, I'm using this, this is very similar, maybe I should be using this instead, this gets like an A rating in Learn Platform. But as Gary said too, if there's not something in our district that we're using currently, they can use the, the wide, you know, widespread. Uh, Just for example, we, we looked, there were four type of programs that were being used at the middle level. And we looked at the learning community and some of them were, were rated rather low. So we were able to look at why they were rated low and now we can, we can um, Consolidate. Go, go to one choice. recommend uh, some of the higher rated programs to teachers that they might not otherwise have known. So. Yeah, there's so much out there. You know, and then it's really tempting to go to what's free, and it's tempting to go to the easiest option, and you may not even realize that the teacher next to you is using something that's also free or that's more effective. And I think it's really difficult on the, the, the central office job to, to get it out there what's best. And this tool really kind of hits the nail on the head of you. You're able to check the criteria right away really quickly. And on top of that, it'll also go through um, the student data privacy piece of it too, which is huge. <coughs> um, go to the next sure. piece. If I can just add one more sure. thing to learn, because I use Learn Platform in my last district, and the other nice thing as we've been, as we kind of are edging into budget season, the nice thing about Learn Platform is that it, it allows you to see if you are working with a company and they're going to allow you to say pilot an application or pilot new software and say we'd like to pilot it for six months. And so oftentimes when we work with them, they'll allow us to do that. The Learn Platform allows us to see how many teachers and how many students are actually utilizing it wow. and utilizing it with fidelity. Mm -hmm. So you. You can say, you know what? Only we're only getting 50% usage out of this. Teachers really aren't finding it helpful, or students really aren't finding it helpful, or using it in the way that it should be used. And then we can say, not a product we probably want to want to spend a lot of money on. Whereas in the past, we might we might you know pilot a textbook, buy a textbook that we then have for a decade that we've spent a lot of money on. With this system, it allows us to really look at who's using it, how are they using it. Uh, whether there's integration between teachers and students and say this is really going to be an effective tool for us and we're going to get a, our best bang for our buck or this is not and so it's been it's get really helpful when it comes to the budget as well in ordering um, uh, resources that are particularly in uh, online so the next piece we kind of talked about a little bit already what it's our role um, we like to go out when we can to other professional learning communities we talked about MassQ. We, we've often gone to um, Medfield's Digital Day of Learning. We went to Lexington for yeah. LexConnect. Mm. <clears throat> and, and when we see those great, inspiring presentations, we like to bring back as much as we can to our not only our school, but to each other and to the other schools as well. So that's a big part of it. We talked also about learning platform and evaluating the products. Um, the things that we bring back, um, she had mentioned, uh, Brooke had mentioned the tech tasting. It's where we took over a staff meeting and we found four or five people that were willing to present something that we brought back. And uh, teachers just went from like a wine room. tasting, <coughs> like little bits and pieces w without the spinning. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, uh, the teachers came out of it and said, This was the best staff meeting. It was, you know, usually it's dry, usually it's nothing mm -hmm. against the principals, but. Um, they thought it was great. 
So we uh, we have another one planned. Uh, Best in uh, Shoba coming up. Um, <laughs> 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 no animals will be hurt. But that's uh, we're gonna do it. Uh, I believe January second at Sawyer. We're gonna do it January 9th uh, in okay. Lancaster, and then we're gonna head out to uh, see Kyle and, and uh, Stowe, and we'll be presenting that in February. And the nice thing too. <clears throat> We, we use the Learn platform to choose the applications we're going to share with the teachers, too. Because we saw there were a couple um, great tools that were being used in maybe one building as opposed to the others, and that we're already paying for, like Newzella, for example, or Pear Deck, or some, some of those things that, that we're really seeing a lot of use in certain buildings, but maybe they're just not introduced to them yet. So we're going to kind of use that Learn platform to, to pick which tools we're going to share out to the staff. And as Dr. McGuire said, uh, we've had uh, two opportunities to do some community education. Um, last spring we did Plugged In Parents, uh, where we had a group of parents come and we uh, let them know what, we're, what the kids are learning and what they should be seeing and how they can help support uh, their children and us. Uh, and just this fall we did Digital Information and Safety Night, which was a little uh, somewhat similar. Um, completely different group of parents, which was great, um, and it's we're starting to gain some traction where we had more people show up this fall than last spring. Yeah. And this is kind of more of what we do in the classroom. <coughs> so we talk a ton with our <coughs> sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders about how the Chromebook can be used, both hardware-wise and software-wise. You know, with, you know, starting the year, obviously, the high focus on digital citizenship, digital footprint, and how, how they can be positive contributors to the online society, right? Um, and also really trying to build on not just being a consumer of technology, but also being a producer. Like that's our goal is, you know, technology is not going away. Let's try to find a way for the kids to be a positive contributor to it and, and you know, be creative and, and use it in a positive way. That's good. And uh, as far as the functionality, having us uh, as a liaison between she and his team, uh, he knows he can come down and see us on A and B day when he has something he wants us to bring to the to the schools and, and vice versa. So. This is cheap slide. Yeah. So um, this is kind of uh, how we deploy Chromebook right now. So the district uh, from our middle school up uh, to high school is true one-to-one. -one. Every student has a dedicated um, Chromebook they can bring home. So meaning like 30 minutes, 7, that's all time you know, they can use that device. Um, starting this coming summer, um, we're going to purchase brand new device for 6th grade and also 9th grade. So for 6th grade students, they're going to use that device all the way to 8th grade. So that will be 3 years. By the end of 3 years, we're going to take those machines back. Um, clean them up, check, make sure everything works, and then we're going to redeploy it for the fourth year. Then for ninth grade, we're going to use from ninth grade all the way to twelfth grade. So once it's done, those machines will be too old, so we're going to just you know, take back, remove all the stickers, wipe out the machine, make sure there's no data on that. We're going to put on a website, uh, kind of just sell it off. So that's how we're going to handle all these homeworks. And this, the, in terms of the evergreening of the Chromebook and you know the deployment of that, you know we really I think gotten very streamlined in terms mm -hmm. of every kiddo has their own uh, when they're in middle school. That is their Chromebook for their three years that they are in middle school. It is theirs, and at the end, and then when they enter ninth grade, they get their Chromebook in ninth grade, and that is theirs for their four years. So um, we streamlined that process in terms of taking care of it um, and and how to take care of it. Um, the other thing that we've also done is that we've, in terms of um, budgeting, uh, we've also purchased the insurance for all kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, we all, we work with a, with a company that if there is an issue with the Chromebook, we're able to get it right out and get it right back into them. And, it come, and that goes through, um, at our middle schools, you know, our ITS department, and then at our high school, it goes through our, our technology gentleman, uh, Glenn, who works in the high school. Um, and the other thing is that I would mention is that those tech tickets that kids used to be putting in for that, that's now put in through Glenn at the high school through one adult. So there's been a huge reduction of those types of tech tickets that are going in because <coughs> kiddos know that that is their Chromebook mm -hmm. and they really do treat it as you know their own personal property. So she's in his department have done a fantastic job 
you know, really streamlining that process with the Chromebooks um, in that evergreening phase. And we, I think that we really hit our stride there. And these two have hit their stride in their role in year two um, in terms of, you know, the ITS work in the classrooms um, and in the district. So you guys are doing a fantastic job. So thank you. And again, I'm just so grateful because I know when we first started talking about it, it's like, what does that even look like? Right. Like, I can't, you know. And here we sit, like two years later. Wow. Like, I'm, just, I, I'm so thrilled to see what we're doing right now. It's just great. And also, actually, um, just for the <clears throat> grade, third grade to fifth grade, we also have plenty of Chromebooks. So they can start like using the Chromebooks <coughs> when they were young. And uh, the setup in those grade levels, um, each classroom has about like five or six. And also they have dedicated cards. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty, mm -hmm. you know, and also this, we have this kind of setup for the IMCAS purpose also. Mm -hmm. We call IMCAS all carried out. Mm -hmm. Right. Chromebooks now. Questions, Leah? Uh, so I believe you guys said that you're from Bolton and Lancaster. Correct. So I'm wondering. I get uh, that question so, too. <laughs> so, that's, so that's a really good question. Great question. It's a great question. In fact, we even had the same discussion the other day around the, the, uh, the administrative table. So uh, part of the issue uh, came two years ago, I think, was it two years ago? Uh, and um, Hale grew so much because of the kids coming up that we only had so many classrooms. Like, I mean, he's really to, to max capacity pretty much over in that building right now. And so at that point in time, um, Kyle decided <coughs> that the IT, and, and we went through a number of different folks through that role too. We just could never quite, I don't think we quite hit the sweet spot of the, the right person over there. And then he really needed that person for a full classroom rather than the ITS role that, like, similar to the, what, the role that these gentlemen play. Um, it's not off our radar completely. Like I say, we've, we've talked about it again about the possibility of bringing that role back on. We did, when we first started this though, we knew that Hale was basically down that position and, it, and we said all the way along that this wasn't just about Bolton and Lancaster and you heard him say, you know, we're gonna hit, like in January, we're gonna hit over to Hale to support them. So I wouldn't want you to think that Stowe is being left behind. It's not, yeah. but it, it doesn't have a dedicated person right now um, like like these two gentlemen the role that these two gentlemen play but it's not off our radar but on a and b days we'll we'll go over there right we'll spend the day we'll spend the day in the staff room staff come in and out and we we throw things at them and uh, we spend some time helping teachers uh, fix their website and we so we're still making it out there Chief. And also, like, uh, actually, I, I brought up this one this morning. You know, we'll have an admin meeting. Uh, I brought this up. So, like they mentioned earlier, like, uh, the tech team and ITS team, you know, we work close together. So even we don't have a dedicated person there, like, my team has been putting extra effort to cover that school. So that's another help. So, so just make you feel a little bit better. So they are not out there by themselves. They like, definitely are not. Yeah, we all, we all. It, it's almost like the fact that they don't have somebody, we're all going yeah. to move, make a move in over there to make sure that that happens. But spa space is becoming an issue over in that building for us. Yeah, so all of that said, <coughs> I totally understand all of these constraints. I would say, though, for consistency, that yep. I think it kind of needs to be a top priority considering the, the direction that the district is headed in. I, I do see um, a skill drop in my own children at Hale. Not, you know, math teacher has to teach math. She can't teach them how to use Google Slides. So mm -hmm. um, those things, I think, need to be addressed. Yeah, well noted. Like I say, we've had that discussion. We're no, yeah, we, we do understand. I think the issue, and I, I, I maybe this might have mentioned before we were talking about the, um, the structure, is um, parity. Are the kids learning the same mm -hmm. things? And what's the skill level? of the kids at Hale compared to the other ones. So I would agree that this is something that needs further investigation. Other questions? Mike? You mentioned at the outset that you um, primarily serve as curators. It so sounds like you find out these um, programs, you deliver them, and you're usually basically going fishing and saying, is this something you could use? Um, is that, is that well, it's a small part of what we do. Um, we just started out with one platform, and that's how, that's what we do with one platform. Okay. There's a lot of data entry to start, okay. and once we get it going, we're it's basically a, a, it'll curate these sites okay. itself. Oh, I see. Okay, so um, I guess that that may or may not answer my next question, which was 
do you ever solicit feedback directly from departments or individual teachers where they say, yeah. hey, we're looking for something that does this? Yeah. Do you have anything? That's, we, we meet with their common planning time weekly. So we'll meet with the sixth grade team, seventh grade team, eighth grade team, and I usually ask, what do you have coming up that you are working on? And then I'll try to find a tool that fits whatever content area they're using. So we just did a video in sixth grade about Gilgamesh and, you know, so we used the Wii Video tool mm -hmm. in my class to learn how to do video editing. And then when I was done teaching the video editing portion of it, we integrated the content and they made their video through the Gilgamesh you know, content. Yeah. Using Wii Video. So that's kind of a snapshot of what we do. We find out what's upcoming, how can we kind of teach those tools in our class so that the regular teacher can just focus on the content and then integrate the tool in there. Does that answer? It you? does. Um, and then to kind of go back to what Leah was saying, do you ever um, go to maybe higher levels and solicit feedback about what skills that they would really like that are missing as the kids come up into higher levels? Yeah. In other words, let's say I'm a ninth grade teacher and I want my kids to know Google Slides or, or Sheets, and do you ever go back and say, all right, well, this is something that needs to happen so that they can have this skill at the We're high actually levels. talking with um, Mary Morata, who does pretty much our job at the high school, and she has started um, Google Sites for all the students at the high school. They all have their own digital portfolio. So that's something that Mary and I have talked about and Gary have talked about, about preparing the kids for high school, making sure they have a digital portfolio through the middle school level, and then preparing one for when they get to the high school. So they'll have it ready for them on the way there. So that's just a small example of it, but I think that answers your question. Too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, without sounding like a broken record, it's just all about Continuity and There's a lot of collaboration between yeah. Mary, because Mary Abrata has that role at the high school, yeah. and these two guys, and Cindy Larson, the, that collaboration yeah. is fantastic yeah. and has yeah. been ongoing. It sounds, sounds really yeah. good. And it, it wasn't one of the more flashy things that are in our job, but yeah. things, like, <laughs> yeah. things like teachers coming up to us and saying, kids don't know how to send an attachment. Exactly. Well, I said, all right, let's put the brakes on. Yep. Yep. Let's teach them how to send an attachment. Right. You know, so. That is a nice thing about we have a little bit of flexibility that way. You know, a, a regular ed, I mean, a, a phys ed teacher has like those five classes and they're locked into those five classes. We don't have as many classes, so we can get into regular ed content. Um, and we can kind of just apply, teach them how to do an email, or teach them how to add an extension, or teach them how to do little things. That are, are you going into the classroom? And as well, yeah. And oh, you're yes. saying, okay, everyone, yeah. here's how you do this. We can. Oh, that's expect great. mostly that happens in eighth grade because I don't have my own time to do it. But anytime a teacher asks for that, it's, yeah, that's the nice thing yeah. about the flexibility of the position. For example, I came into the position a little later uh, last year, and our eighth grade uh, social studies teacher has kids make videos, uh, period type commercials. And uh, she asked me to come in and teach the kids how to use video. I'm like, well, you know, I can't teach them in two minutes and then have you teach your, your, cur you know, your curriculum. So I said, why don't I, that's how I weasel my way in. I said, why don't you give me the kids, I'll teach them how to use Wii Video, and then I'll come into your class and I'll support them as they start using it and you teach your curriculum. Mm -hmm. So that's some of what we do as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so technology is not something that they just put down at the end of the school day and don't use at home. Obviously, it carries mm -hmm. with them. Um, and you know, you you mentioned the community education um, seminars, but I was wondering about other ways that um, you could potentially either share resources or educate parents. I'm guessing yeah, the community in general, but mostly parents about. For me specifically, it's digital safety and privacy, um, mm -hmm. so that all the work that you're doing during the day in the schools is not kind of lost when they get home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about, we, we had a online safety and, you know, basically we, the presentation we gave, was that one in the spring? Yeah, I think Dr. McGuire posted them online too. Yeah, uh, on the, on the okay. district website, so parents, if they're not able to go, they can see what we're doing. A lot of it was based on, you know, balance, right? It's not going away. You've got to find a way to, to eliminate or limit distractibility, you know? Take While the, keeping them safe. Yeah. Keep taking the Chromebook to the bed at night and being up all night. It's not something that we intended for the Chromebook to be used to, you know? We, we want to make sure that 
they're they're understanding they're not anonymous online. They're you know all that digital safety stuff is was covered in our presentation, but that's really kind of driven home all year with the two of us. We we literally talk about like the privacy settings on Instagram and things like that. Like you, you, even if you have it, we're not condoning that you have it, but you got to know how to use it the right way if you have it. When you get the privacy statement sent to you, do you just click agree or do you actually mm -hmm. read it? Yeah. Right, yeah, no, and, and I know you, that you too are specifically responsible for, for educating the entire world about like digital safety. Um, but I, I think that, that as a society, we're kind of losing something when the kids get home um, because there, there's not a, either the monitoring or the knowledge or the understanding from the people well, outside using, of the school. If they're using a district sound device, if they're using their Chromebooks, uh, and going through our firewall, we're able to see yeah, the, everything yeah, that they need access. That. And, and, that's and we let them know that from the start. Yeah, yeah. that's so. very clear. Yeah. And also, uh, for the Chromebook, once students take them at home, so everything they do, they have the same protection just like they are at school. <coughs> so we have an extension okay. installed on Chromebooks. So everything they do at home also gets filtered. So mm -hmm. all those bad stuff will be blocked. Okay, that's good. Yeah. And, and they get reports based on mm -hmm. certain things as well. So it's yeah. pretty. That's exactly it's right. Pretty, every week. It's every week. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the message we give the kids. Like, if there's something that you're doing that's unsafe online, we're going to know, and, and we want to keep you safe. It's not that we want to look at your Chromebook. It's right. more that we want to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw a definite dip where um, certain certain sites like cool math games has nothing to do with math. They're just cool games. And the kids <laughs> like them, right? But it says cool math games, so it, it gets through. But we tell them, <coughs> learn platform and, and other things that she has in place, pick up on that. And we know who's going there, how many times. So once we told them that, all of a sudden there's this big dip on people accessing cool math games. Because they know that well, someone's watching in some ways to you know, yeah. so look at their history and make sure that they're good. Leah, Thank just you. very quickly, I know I'm hammering it, <coughs> but you've talked now about video editing and um, coding, right? These are things that the Hale kids are not being exposed to. So I, I feel they, very. They have, yeah. Seventh grade computer science. Yeah, they have seventh grade yeah, computer yeah. science. Which and is different from what you're offering how. So I didn't realize. It's, it's, a, didn't realize it's a full that. class. So. This, the sixth grade at Hale has five sections. Yeah. So similar to eighth grade, they have Spanish as their fifth section. Yep. Same with seventh, they have a fifth section. Instead of having us, they have a full-time class that meets every day. Every day, 45 So minutes. that teacher has flexibility, like we do, to kind of expand their curriculum. They're not just teaching math, science, English, social studies. They have their called plus class. And in seventh grade, it's called computer science class. So they're taking a full year of computer science. I can't but speak to... But they don't get that at, at your schools? Correct. Correct. That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. But they get us. Okay, so it seems like in the, in the end it's balanced. Correct. That's yes. how we've so tried we, to... We feel that it's given balanced, the yeah. Budget it's so that's but, what we've done. But, but it's, it's still noteworthy that, that that piece is missing, like in terms of a person. Like, I mean, so we're, we're openly admitting, yes, we've had that right. discussion. We understand that that's a, but we still feel that there's balance, balance over there. And so we want to work with those teachers that are in those mm -hmm. positions as well. And they let them know what we're doing. They're, they're, letting us what, no. they're letting us know what they're doing. We just mm -hmm. don't have time to do some of it. But. In the interest of time, any more questions? Or comments. I just want to thank you yeah. guys. This yeah, has been, I, when I first got on the committee, I'll be honest, these technology presentations were painful. <laughs> um, and I didn't feel that I knew any more after than when we began. And I think the partnerships and the leadership has just cut such a long way because you're really focused on what kids need and supporting teachers to support kids. So thank you for all the work. And again, this is just such a great model for uh, organizing curriculum and professional development. So thank you for both of you for your leadership in this regard. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we have our staffing update. And we're gonna ask Anne Marie to come to the table. Come on down. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. 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 Oops.
But see, we had a fall, the last time I updated was in the fall, we talked about our hiring season, and we talked about, and we acknowledged the people, uh, we talked about our new staff, we acknowledged the people who had reached the career milestone of getting professional teacher status. Mm -hmm. And tonight, I'd like to give you numbers um, of our, um, our staffing numbers. Um, and I've also been asked to talk about um, the impact to, of the two year ago increase in our sub-teacher pay um, and about our automated substitute system. Mm -hmm. So the first slide, Um, show that there are three slides. They, we have three categories of employees. We have the Unit A members, we have the Unit C members, and we have the, the people who aren't in any unit. All those people totaled are 542. We have 542 employees. And that's a head count. That's not a full-time equivalent count. So that's how many, how many bodies? One head each. So that's 542 heads. Um, unit Ayers, uh, the breakdown is right there. The teach, special educators are teachers. So really, teachers, if you add those two together, there are 277 teachers and they represent 51% of our staff. Unit A is our 61%. Down at the bottom, the OT, that's those are occupational therapists, PTs are physical therapists, and BCBAs are board certified behavior analysts. So those are our unit Aers. We have 167 unit C employees. Our unit C employees, um, those are the categories of them. You can see those there. That represents 31% of our employees. If you add together from the previous slide the teachers, the special educators, and the instructional assistants, um, those are the people who have direct, direct instructional responsibility for students. The 67% of our staff members have direct instructional um, contact with the, with the students. And lastly, these are the unaffiliated, but these are, for the most part, the administrators, and, and there they all are. 8% of our um, of our staff administrators, and that's, uh, that's in general, my colleagues have, that's uh, that's, fairly, that's fairly low percentage of our um, staff, mm -hmm. our administrative. Any questions on those three? Those are, I'm going to show by the numbers. <laughs> that's us. Is that, that should we are us. Substitute teachers, uh, no slide here. We have about 50 substitute teachers who work for us regularly, and there are another 25 who work for us uh, a little bit less regularly. Um, what's the optimum number? How many would we like to have? That's, that's a, I don't know, that's a fine line because we wanna have enough substitutes to meet our daily needs, but not so much that we have them not being used because mm -hmm. if they're not used, then they're gonna go on to our ASOP, which is now called Frontline Program, and they're going to sign up for other districts. So really, sometimes putting on more nets you less people because they, you know, oh, I can't love to work for you today, but today I'm in Hudson filling in for Leah, you know, or something like that. So we want to have, uh, we want to really have just the, the perfect number. Also, too, we need to have a little bit more than we need for our daily use because um, we restrict our subs to um, to four days a week because if they go beyond that regularly, then um, we have the problem of um, health insurance having to offer them health insurance because they'll be eligible, so we have to be careful about that. We need, on average, about 19 subs each day to fill the need for people who are out, and we get about uh, we get about 13. So every day, we have about six unfilled positions district-wide. And it's not quite this clean, but it averages out, because we have six schools, it averages out to about one slot um, unfilled each day in mean, each school. This isn't just an Ashoba issue, this is a, a huge topic of conversation on the listserv for the people who have my jobs in other districts. And we have our, um, our State Association of School Personnel Administrators at meetings. <coughs> this is a hot topic. You know, what do you think about so Bless you. Bless you. It's, it's just everybody. So, and our, so, our, so that's a 68% fill rate. Fill rate is 100%. That would mean that everybody who needed a sub had a sub. Mm -hmm. And we're at about 68%. That's been very, that's held steady, except for a slight increased to about 75% fill rate right after in, when in September of 2017 you raised the pay for the substitute teachers from $70 to $80. We got a little bit of a, of a bump up there, but it was not long-lived. I think everyone else had the same idea. So, <laughs> so 
<laughs> really, our, our, our uh, pay now is in is really in line with the other teachers, and we're back to 68%. And 68%, I know, doesn't sound very good. If you look at it, though, in terms of um, you know one person per school per day, it's, it doesn't seem quite so horrible. Um, a lot of that, some things that drive that, we have this year, we've got nine, these are the ones we know about so far, nine maternity leaves. Um, and sometimes, when we're looking to fill a long-term supposition, who are we going to go to? We might go to someone from our day-to-day -day list who's showed, uh, you know, who's distinguished themselves. So when that happens, we get a good person, often a, a you know, most often a licensed teacher, in to fill for the maternity leave, that's great. But then that person is unavailable for the day-to-day -day sub list. So in, in one way, we're a victim of our own success. You know, the ones who are really good sometimes end up, uh, end up going there. The other time when we have a particular problem with subs is if we've got large-scale professional development. You know, if you're going to do something in professional development and you want you know, all the fourth grade teachers together, there's no way, there's no way that's going to happen, you know, that you're going to have one sub for all of those fourth grade teachers to put the professional development. Principals are very clever about working things out and really have special note at the high school because the teachers at the high school have got two periods that are not with students at the prep period, you know, they do, they were the things. So what they've done is they've made like a puzzle piece so that if they, because the subs don't need to do preparation for the next day because they're day-to-day -day subs. So they have been um, piece working so that if someone's got this period and this period free from their teacher, you can take two of those people and fill in for a sub. So they've done some things so even though it looks like that's not a fill, really there's a substitute um, in with those, uh, with those kids. Um, we do very well filling for absences that are planned. But a lot of our subs don't like to get the morning, you know, they'll wake up, I'm sick, and I call in calls. They don't like to get those, and they can set it up in our system, our frontline system, so that they don't get those calls. So that's a little bit harder to fill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's actually a couple of <coughs> agencies, excuse me, who have who popped up to fill the need, try to provide substitutes for the schools, and they say the same thing, that they say that they, 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 they boast that they can um, improve your fill rate by about, let's say, 10%, which to us would be one or two people a day. <clears throat> but then they'll go on, and the, the rest, second half of that sentence is, but we have a hard time with the for the morning calls. They're most, most successful with the ones that are planned. Well, so are we, you know? And, and they've got the, the added um, problem, really, for the ones who offer this service that they have a cadre of people, but they're not right next door, you know, so that they, the morning sub, the morning calls are very difficult. Um, they say the people who have tried it, you know, they don't have tried those. So that's, uh, that's what we have. The only other number I wanted to give you was that we've, um, we've got three people who have announced retirements, you know, for, for the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. and of course, that will increase, of course, you may imagine, but. Um, Is there a deadline they have to meet? If, uh, no. If they wanted to get the reti the early retirement center, they would have had to let us know by last year, okay. I think May, I think it is. Okay. Um, but uh, no, if they, if they didn't do that, mm -hmm. then they don't. We have had some people announce uh, intent to retire for like the last day that they get that retirement center. You may recall that at the last contract negotiation, yes. that's gonna go away. Yes. So people are asking the question, you know, when do I, you know, what's the, what's the last date? Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's 20, 20, June 30, 2023, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that. Okay. There right. we go. Do you have questions, questions for me? Okay. 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 Uh, can we just. Oh, good. Thank you, oh, Sam. Yes. Can, can we uh, just talk about the high school with what we've just done at the high school? I just mentioned that with uh, the, the position of the dean students. Oh, yes. Um, Jamie Tucker, who is the phys ed teacher and uh, the football coach, um, is been temporarily assigned uh, to be um, an interim. Dean of Students. He's going to help um, Steve and Beth with um, primarily with student discipline issues. So we've filled, a, we've put a long-term sub in to Jamie starting on the day after tomorrow, starting on Thursday, and he's going to be um, like part of that administrative team to help um, to help with that piece of the of the coverage. I think they, I think he sent out something. Steve sent out something today saying mm -hmm. what exactly which portion of the I don't, I don't remember what it was, but which portion of the student party he's going to tend to. So we've got one more set of hands you know, to help him through this time. And that's the, that's a position that's staying in Unit A. So I want to thank the, uh, thank our um, union for working uh, closely with us on that as well. And so quickly too, they were so and so quickly, yeah. and Jamie as well for uh, stepping up to the plate to help us out with this. So mm -hmm. very much appreciate that.
question. Right. So is, the students are aware of that? Yeah, I believe that that went out to the it's schools and parents. Okay, when you said it went out, I wasn't sure who yeah. that was referring to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Anne Marie? Okay, thank you for the thank you. you. We appreciate it. Okay, Pat Murray, come on down. We're going to hear about um, extended day rate review. Yes. So, in the spirit of um, bringing forth any rate changes early enough so that parents can plan for the next school year, I want to bring. Um, this proposal of increasing the extended day rates by 2%. Um, I think that this is reasonable. I've gone over the numbers. Um, I think this will work great for us. Um, for the before school program, which is that short period of time in the morning that some students are dropped off for a five day program, there, it's only an increase of $25 a year. So uh, I, I believe that this 2% increase. Excuse um, me, Pat. For the benefit of the new members, could you sort of just take us back a few years to when we decided to do this? Sure, sure. Um, and yeah, so I can do that. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, it had been some time since we had increased the rates. And we decided that we needed to look at the expenditures. And we wanted to make the extended day program self-sustaining. So in doing so, we had to increase the rates a little bit, and we wanted to do it in, uh, I think it was a little bit higher at first, but yes. then after that, um, we wanted to make sure that when we had these increases, that it was something that parents could afford. Because most of the time, this is, these are working parents, and they're working to pay these costs, and, and I think it's just really important that you let them know far enough in advance so they can plan for it. So that's why I'm bringing this forth now, so that for next year, we'll plan for, you know, people can plan. So, uh, like I started to say, the before school program, it's for the five day program, which would be the highest in cost, is $25. And then it, it drops by four days, three days, two days, you know, th and this is an annual cost. And for the after school program, for a five day, student, it's $74 a year. So I think it's really affordable. Um, this, the program is very popular right now, and this still, this moderate increase, I think, gives us the opportunity to still sustain the program that we have in existence. Mm -hmm. Questions for Pat? Mike? <laughs> um, I might have missed it, but what is the driver behind the proposed increase? Salaries, just get the contract salaries, the contract obligations. Yeah, I yeah. think when we, there was a year that we there was a significant increase mm -hmm. because I don't I think it had been ten years where the rates remained the same and we were subs we were set, the district was essentially subsidizing this voluntary program um, just to to cover the cost. It was not self sustaining. So there was I think it was the budget committee at the time decided that after the, um, the big increase that they would settle on a percentage so that people could anticipate it and where the salary levels go up about 2% overall every year. That's what, why, they why we're going to see it go 2%. So that's basically a little bit of the history. Okay, and then um, there is, from my understanding, there's a financial support component to extended day? Oh yes. It's yes. yes. A slight That's still an existence. Yeah. And so does what will that will that change be commensurate <clears throat> with these changes yes. as well? Okay. Yeah, that changes with okay. that. Okay. It's good. based on a percentage. Yeah. So. Okay, good. <clears throat> so tonight I would ask that you vote on this rate change and I think I put forward a motion. Yep. Yep, Elaine's going to uh, read the yeah. motion. I'll move to increase the extended day program tuition rate 2% for the 2020-2021 school year as presented. Second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Okay. Thank you. And so, so now next. we're doing the capital, the capital request. And this is for the high school and for the <coughs> So it would be capital items that affect the entire district, not the individual buildings, buildings. like 
the capital expenditures that the member towns would be responsible for. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have any questions about anything that's on here? And I'll, I'll probably address that first and then I can touch on a couple of other things. That yeah, I think just hit the, some of the salient points and I think that they can take it back and take a look at it. Okay, I think um, I, I, I noted that some of them are critical needs, almost all of them are critical needs. I would say that the only one that probably isn't a, um, a, um, a critical need at this point is um, a light post that was knocked down several years ago that we want to put back up because it's so dimly lit in, in that area of the parking lot at the high school. I think it's really important that we um, replace that light before somebody gets hurt. It's so a safety issue. The, the items on this list about the oil tank replacement um, and the leach field, those, mm -hmm. are the, those are the items that we have been talking about for a year, is that correct? No, it, are these we should be ones? looking at fiscal year 21. These are my requests. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So basically, that was helpful, thanks. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I put see. fiscal year 20 okay. in oh. there just so, so that you can you see. We yes, have an okay, idea of what we requested last year and, sure. and where we are with that, and that there's a key at the bottom. Okay. It will kind of give you an indication. Yeah, I, I saw that. All right. Yep. Um, so then my question is, with regard to the leach field, and that was the money that we had to ask the towns for, Yes. was the total cost $250,000, or is there more money that, that we paid for that? <coughs> the, um, the total cost for both projects. So yeah, with respect to that, was, was it was it was just um, under five hundred thousand. Oh, the oil yeah. tank and, yeah. and the, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. It was now. actually almost a hundred thousand dollars less than we had okay. thought we were going to have to borrow. Right. Okay. Other questions for for Pat, Mike? Pat, does the um, the number associated with the track include what is already available in our stabilization fund? Um, a portion of that is in the stabilization. Mm -hmm. I, I believe a hundred thousand. Okay. So, so of the 178, 100 is not the request. The request is right. the difference. Right, but these are capital items that will be part of this budget. Okay. So we will know that. But to Mike's point, so that's in the budget, but we have 100,000 in the stabilization yes. fund. That you'd have to so see on a revenue that we would line. Draw, uh, that would be on a revenue line, okay. Right. Yes. Yep. Elaine? Um, yeah, can you talk more about the track and sort of the timeline for the maintenance hmm. and repair or it, it, you can do it vaguely if you want but like okay. well i'm know, not the expert and rob couldn't be here tonight oh. so I'm, I'm kind of winging it so um from what i understand the wear layer is the top layer um and it's important when that starts to show signs of wear that it be replaced because if it isn't then it will damage the sub layer mm -hmm. and if, and then once you do that then it's more of a problem. Mm -hmm. We're still, um, I, don't, I, I just don't want to give a, a, a number of years if it's not correct, mm -hmm. but this should give us like three or four more years anyway before we have to do anything major, which would be to replace the entire track, you know, the entire um, carpet. Sure, carpet. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I can bring Rob back in at some point in time. Well, he'll be back in anyway, I'm sure, for something. Well, and you, yeah, yeah, and you've got the January meeting that yeah, you can ask some right. questions mm -hmm. on as well. I think tonight it was more about saying, this is what's coming. This is what you're going yeah. to see in the budget line, mm -hmm. budget lines, and then you've got some time to go go home, reflect on it, and then you know form, formulate some questions for okay, us. Steve. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't see in here anything for the PFAS. Um, there wouldn't be. There wouldn't be a is that for the schools? us. Is that no. the is that Stowe's responsibility? Yes. yes. Okay. That's yes. a great question. And they, yeah. And they approved it at Yeah. yeah. So it should be all set. Okay. Other other questions. So there are um, a couple of other things that are related to the sewer plant, which everything related to the sewer plant is always critical mm -hmm. because when things start to go, a lot of the equipment when is original. Back up, they back up. Yeah. <laughs> And they so, do there. They really do. <laughs> yes. So the, we've been advised that it's time to replace these pieces that are on here. So that's what we do. There, there isn't anything for the high school as far as the building goes. Um, that's um, we, 
that we can really put off this on this list right now. Okay, other questions? Okay, thank you, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Not done yet. Donations. I have some donations. Oh, okay. And I Wait, do we need to approve this in any way? No, I think it's no, FYI. No, this is FYI. Okay. Um, yes. Before you, before you go in and sure. detail all the budgets, considering the time, uh, I mean all the all the uh, donations. Um, I would I would like to make a motion, and then you can discuss it afterwards. I would like to make a motion that we approve all of the donations that have been offered to the Neshoba Regional School District, with our thanks to the donator donators. Can we do that? All in one. Yeah, I don't see any reason why you can't together? do it. Yeah, I'm thinking we can lump them together. Okay. 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 Alita. Can we? We have a letter on each one. We have a letter on each one. So we have letters. Letters have to show a vote on each one, don't they? Uh, well, then. Well, you know, I think you can accept them all three together, but I should let you know mm -hmm. what they are. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. why don't we do that, yeah, and then we'll vote the them all sure. together. All right. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll be pretty brief with this. Um, there's a six hundred dollar <coughs> donation for the Luther Burbank Middle School um, for their trip to the eighth grade, um, the eighth grade trip of Washington D Street C trip. Mm -hmm. And there's an and it's an anonymous. So. Mm -hmm. And there's a second anonymous donation too, to pay off the outstanding lunch balances of students in both schools, both the Luther Burbank and the Mary Rollinson School, <coughs> uh, as of December 4th. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, you, can you share what that amount is? Yes, $1,055.70. Oh, that's cool. And then last on the list, um, this is actually from the Alice Eaton Fund. This is actually more like a grant, but I, it, it needs to be um, brought before the committee. Um, we have a grant from them for $34,500. And this donation will support materials and medical supplies for students. And um, it's classroom audio technology, um, vision screening equipment, health services equipment, and um, brain power transition glasses. And this is district wide. No, this is just. Oh, no, this is a college. This is different. So. This is the Alice Eaton for the center school. For the center school, yeah. I see. Joseph, do you have a question? No, oh, okay. no question. No. Okay, so with all the information um, for the three, um, um, the grants and the two donations, all in favor of accepting? Opposed? Do we get a second? I don't. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Steve. So now thank you. we are, uh, thanks, Pat. The MSBA letter. Yeah, I'm just going to um, talk quickly because uh, I know it's getting quite late here ton tonight, and I, we still got the school choice and the policies. But this is, I think, more just a, a, a quick FYI. I want to read the letter that we got from uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, it says, Dear Superintendent Clenchy, I am I am pleased to report that the Massachusetts School Building Authority Board of Directors voted to invite the statement of interest uh, for the SOI for the Neshoba Regional High School in the Neshoba Regional School District into the MSBA's eligibility period. The 270-day eligibility period formalizes and streamlines the beginning of the MSBA's grant approval process and benefits the district by providing a definitive schedule for the completion of preliminary requirements, assisting with the determination of financial and community readiness and identifying needs for planning and budgeting. A successful completion of all activities in the eligibility period will allow the district to be eligible for an MSBA invitation to feasibility study. So it's like the feasibility study is like at the end of this phase going into the, the next. Invitation into the eligibility period is not an invitation to feasibility study, so we want to be really clear on that. Moving forward in the MSBA's process requires collaboration with the MSBA and an invitation to feasibility study will require a further vote 
of the MSBA's board of directors. So we'll have to go again before them uh, to, to go to that next level. Communi and this is a caution. Communities that get ahead, and quotation marks, of the MSBA without MSBA approval will not be eligible for grant funding. So we want to make sure that we do, we never ever get ahead of where we should be in this process. Additionally, the district's vote by the Board of Directors approving a potential grant will be no sooner than July 1st, 2022. To qualify for any funding from the MSBA, local communities must follow the MSBA's statute and regulations which require MSBA partnership and approval at each step of the process. The district's eligibility period will commence on June 1st, 2020. So in essence, a couple of things that, that we want to put out there is that we really won't be doing any work with MSBA at all until June 1st, 2020. And in part that's because the 11 schools that are basically queued up are all queued up at different times so that there's not a, a like a glut of schools at one one point in time with MSBA. So our work with them really doesn't start until 2020 and it will conclude on February 26, 2021. During this time, the district must complete the preliminary requirements in accordance with the schedule on page three of this letter. The first item that, requ that requires completion by the district is the initial compliance certification, which will be sent to the district electronically two weeks prior to its commencement date on May 18th, 2020. So I'm not gonna read all of it, but it gives it, it certainly gives a flavor. And I think, Alita, we have another slide that we, we're gonna put up there as well that shows how um, prescribed the process is for us. And um, certainly, I, I, you know, one of the things as I've watched MSBA over the course of the last 10 or so years, I think they've just gotten better and better at their work. And um, you'll see that there are literally modules now that, you know, that are in place. So for example, the SOI component was really the first module that we've completed. And, and in part, like when we sat in the orientation meeting, um, after the <coughs> meeting uh, where the vote took place, was basically to hand us off to the next group, right? So Diane Sullivan and her group were really the group that started, that helped to support us through the SOI uh, process. Now we have Brittany Gomes who will help support us in at the next phase as we continue to work through. And whenever we can get that up there, you'll see that there are very, very specific phases that, that will get us through whatever that process can is. Can we add that to the like. meeting materials of like a PDF of what the modules are? So it's And that's exactly when yeah, it comes yeah. up. Yeah, that's exactly what, yes. And okay. I think we, we can absolutely do that. Sure. And, and you'll see them. Uh, we also got a print out that uh, at, at the meeting when we were there that kind of showed us a, a really nice snapshot mm -hmm. as well. And is this, if, is this what you're... no, it's no. not. <clears throat> Thank you for showing that. So, a, a couple of things to also know: there's really only two times when votes need to go forward, um, and and one is inside of this two-year, basically a two-year window now. Um, and then there will be another one that comes there after when, when the communities make the decision of what it is that they want in either a new building uh, or a majorly renovated building uh, or modernization, whatever you want to call it. What, uh, the community's decision is that. But I, I don't want anyone out there to think, and I don't think that we would have anyone out there, but I think we just need to say this is not something that we're digging ground you know, even in a year. This is a five to seven year process. We can amp it up. We're certainly poised to amp it up a little bit if we if we could, but it's, it's not something that could be amped up like in three years or two years. It's going to be that five to seven year stint. Um, so, and I think that because they've done such a good job, thank you, there it is there. You can see the different, mo uh, the different modules. And now, of course, we are in this first module here. And if you take a look down, it's very prescribed. If you can just scroll down, there's district, the module four, module five, module six, module seven, there we go, finally. So it's a very prescribed process that we're entering in. I really appreciate that because I think that we have really good guidance at every step of the way. Um, so it's not like, you know, they kind of turn it over to the school district and say, you know, build the school. It's like, okay, 
here are the step by step fraud. Uh, you know, so you've got really rich experience at every step to help the district walk through the process. Um, when we take a look at you know the the options that are clearly in front of us, and there may be other options out there too. We won't know that till a feasibility study is done, but. Uh, you know, they talked about the notion that MSBA's already built schools that we might want to take a look at and say, yeah, that's a, a plan that we, we might want to look at. And or we just look at a major modernization um, program. That's a plan as well. Maybe you just want to focus on science wings or wh whatever that might look like or gymnasiums or auditoriums. And or we take a look and say, so what does it look like for a made in Neshoba building? Um, I've suggested already that I think that we, and, and those of you on personnel subcommittee already know that we're looking at starting in January of working in this area, starting with our educators first and then branching out. And the notion was to try to get a bit of a skeletal idea of what our educators are thinking, their needs are in the building, and then starting to move it out. Because of course you want lots of community input from students, from staff, from parents, from community members. So you're really starting on a very lengthy, very rich process. But we are just at the baby steps right now. So I don't want anyone to think because we just got this approval, this means that we're going into something really quickly or it isn't that way at all. It's just starting on the very cusp of basically what will be a five to seven year process. The communities can stop this at any point in time. They can stop it even right now at the feasibility. Like if we get, if we complete everything here on the eligibility and we go towards that, you know, the feasibility study, if they decide, no, we don't want to, we don't have any interest in doing this anymore, it can stop right there. So, you know, it, it, this is really up to the communities to decide what they want moving forward. I would suggest to you that I think that you know we've done a lot of work. I say we as a collective we, as you had mentioned earlier, uh, um, Chairman Cody, and mentioned the notion of the space study that, that or, you know that group that first started this way back, I think six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's been a lot of build up to getting us to this point in time. Um, I I would would think that you would want the uh, the communities would want to push forward with this i would think that you'd want to do that because you really need to be looking at education in the next 20 years is really what you're wanting to do right now you're not looking at just education in the next five years you want to look ahead um i, I don't know what your chances <coughs> would be i mean when you think that there were only 11 schools that got in this time if you withdraw i'm not sure how quickly you could get back Queued, queued up again, so I think that that's something that our communities are going to want to uh, ponder as well. I, uh, um, I just want to say again how, how much I respect and appreciate uh, the partnership that we've had with Mass School Building Authority, and again I want to thank our previous school committee uh, members for having the foresight to look ahead here and say, yeah, we want to start this process. Because if you think about it, I mean, it, you, you had said earlier, like probably two of your kids might be able to take advantage of this and two kids might not, you know, like as you look to the, the age of your own children, like your children probably would be able to take advantage of it. I, I don't know where your kids, do you know what I mean? So you want, you, you kind of want to think, you're really thinking ahead for your next generation of learners, uh, for, uh, you know, so. So that's just, uh, just a quick nutshell of where we're at. Um, no, no pressure right now on votes or anything like that. We've got time to think this through and be thoughtful. And I think that as uh, Dr. Foster comes in and starts to do his work in building the Ed Plan, because the Ed Plan is something we need for this process. Um, he's got experience with doing this, and he's also uh, gone through a build uh, in his own district as a parent. So that's kind of interesting because he brings that lens. He sat on the, the building committee as a parent. So he comes at this for this work from a lot of different angles. So I'm very excited to uh, to have him included with this work uh, starting next month. So that's a quick over, overview. Any questions for Brooke? Leah? I would just say that even if none of my kids would benefit from this building, I think it's incredibly important and um, I support it 100% uh, in whatever form it takes. But uh, my other question is, 
When can the community expect to be brought into those conversations uh, around the Ed Plan? Well, I think that that, that will probably be, again, you, you have to keep in mind that we are not starting our work with MSBA until June. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably follow the, the lead that they will provide for us. Uh, I would suspect it probably won't be until like early in the new school years when I suspect our communities will start to have involvement. In terms of their need to understand the implications of the SOI, have we released a press release or have, what, what communication has been done? Yeah, we Just actually sent out. something, yes, yeah. we did, did okay. a press release out and we also sent an email out to all of our families. Okay. So, um, which kind of mirrored the press release. Is the, S is the SOI on the website? I think the SOI is generally on the MSBA website. Uh, I don't know if it's on our own website. I doubt that it's on our own website. But they can certainly, I'm, I'm sure you'll find it on the MSBA because they generally pub, uh, uh, publicize them. Whether you get it queued up or not, it's generally on there. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to find it easily. Okay. Uh, and then, um, so I've only had two, maybe three opportunities to speak directly with MSBA representatives. Um, but every time I have, they have come across as incredibly confident and also very clear in their yes. communications and expectations. <clears throat> so I have to say, um, sometimes working with you know large governments can seem like a large bureaucracy or can seem overwhelming, confusing. I have to say this is one agency where I did not get that impression at all. So I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm actually very optimistic about following their plans and taking their lead. I mean, they, they do this for schools all across the state. Mm -hmm. um, the, oh, the other thing I was going to say is, so I've been working on some catchphrases <laughs> for how to explain this process to the community who probably doesn't have the interest or the time to get into the details like we will be. <laughs> um, but I think this first module, um, I've been calling getting our ducks in a row, or actually my favorite one has been planning to plan. It's a good one. And so people say, oh, okay, we're, we're putting the brakes on. This is going to be slow for a long while. So I think people get it when you put it in those terms. I think that's good, it's really good. and that's, that's what good teachers do. Thank you. <laughs> now i got to work on module two to be ready. Okay, you got some time. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we are at old business. Um, we have to do a school choice vote. So what we'll do is we'll hear the motion, and then we will discuss, and then we will vote. Board board before you get to that point. Yes. Okay, and I know that your time's sensitive here. And I don't want no, no, to that's okay. Time, I'm retired. I have all the time in the world. Uh, yeah, there's an old expression from a song by Don <laughs> Henley that says, lawyers dwell on small details. And this may very well be a small detail, so I apologize. Well, sure. I also apologize we'll for not seeing that we have a school choice hearing scheduled on the agenda. I went right from one down to old business, and I did yeah, not yeah, see yeah. that. Okay. Um, just so it's clear. The, the public hearing we had this evening was in accordance with Chapter 76, Section 12B, and not Chapter 77, which is a repeal statute from 1973 involving I think training schools. So noted. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, it, that being said, generally speaking, school committees throughout Massachusetts don't generally hold a lot of public hearings. But select boards do, city councils do on a pretty regular basis. And there is a protocol to public hearings. You open the public hearing, you take public comment. We had none this evening, none. And then the committee in whole votes to close the public hearing. I see. We did not close the public hearing. So I would think it would be appropriate because it looks to me uh, by the agenda that we're going to vote on this tonight. Yes. Okay. And I think you're probably going to call for a vote. So I think it's appropriate for the chair to entertain a motion to close the public hearing at this point, seeing that there's no further okay. input in this. Yep. And then we would then proceed to deliberation Thank on the you. issue. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll so move it if you if you like. I would love it. Right. Second. Okay. Okay. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Opposed? Okay. And thank you, because I'm not good on the details, but I appreciate no, I, your your knowledge of it. I'm probably the only person who looked up the statute. That's, That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. But thank you. Okay. So. Um, We'll make the motion, um, and then we'll discuss, and then we'll vote. So would you make the motion? Um, yeah, the wording here is a little wonky, so. No, it's the required wording. I know. Okay. I know it's required. I'm just saying it might not be what you're expecting <laughs> to hear. Um, I will move to withdraw from participation in the school choice program for the 2020-2021 school year. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Thank you. Um, 
I think one thing <coughs> that um, school choice would afford us that we would be missing out should it be, um, I guess, voted for um, is um, an opportunity to introduce more diversity into the town. Um, and I feel like that's really important in a district like ours. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't want this to be misconstrued as an opportunity for me to say, here's how I'm gonna vote. Mm -hmm. But I think I would like to be mindful as a committee about other opportunities to introduce that level of diversity into our schools because I think it's really important for those kids coming into our district and an opportunity to learn in a district that has um, high academic standards, but also our kids interacting and collaborating with kids from out of our district. Thank you. Other comments, discussion? Oh, yes. Sorry, do we have um, a better sense than the last meeting, and maybe the answer is no, of how many students in each grade we would be talking about? No, because we didn't we didn't break it down uh, to to say that we could do this many kids in this grade or that that no I didn't do that at all to okay. break it down. Okay, but so if we vote, let's say if we voted tonight to be Withdraw. in the school choice program, then what are we actually like? What numbers are we accepting? And and that's exactly because you asked for my recommendation. My recommendation, and I've said this before. Although I support school choice, I think it's not something at this moment in time we should do this this particular current year. So I wasn't prepared to come forward and say here's the numbers or here's what we would suggest. So nothing like that type of suggestion came to you. But you can do if if the decision is to do school choice then um, that would be the charge to make to a, um, a decision. To send me back to do something, yes. something okay, like that. I just want to understand what the consequences would be of the vote. Right. Okay. If you're the locking yourselves into something or not. Well, if we don't have any spaces, I mean, so I don't, if we don't have spaces or we have concern, if we look at what the typical um, new enrollment is of people moving in and what the attrition is. Um, so um, there, there'd have to be a thoughtful approach to, to determining it. I don't know yeah. if there's a deadline for doing that. No. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Steve, okay. yeah. Can we limit in any way, shape, or manner school choice of coming into the district, for example? Can we say, well, we'll take three and pale and five. No, you don't do it by school. Uh, that's what I'm... Yeah. So we really, okay. it, we're really, we're really at the, at the whim of the, uh, of the people who want to bring, bring their children in here. And we have, we really have no idea until we either say yes or no, because that could open the floodgates there. We know it's interesting, at our administrative meeting this morning, we were talking about the number of new bodies into Lancaster, actually was uh, the discussion that started this morning. And how many of those are at the kindergarten level? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's just move-ins mm -hmm. that we have. And, and of course, that is the concern: <coughs> is you you don't know who's moving into your district, mm -hmm. and um, and and that's one of the concerns I have, especially mm -hmm. when we've got these new school new subdivisions on the mm -hmm. cusp. We there's no way of predicting what's coming in. That's right. Mm -hmm. Other comments. You know, I was going to say, but you know, I was serving when Choice came in, and I know it has, it was well intended, and there's a lot of altruistic uh, motivation behind the statute. But mm -hmm. I think for anybody who's been in Massachusetts and been in education for a long time, I think you can also look at the sort of the darker side at, at Choice, and that while Choice has helped bring diversity to certain districts, it also served in some limited capacities to. Um, create non-diversity in districts. And you would see, that back, at least back in the mid-90s, you would see certain uh, school districts losing certain um, individuals going to other districts. Sure. And that what you were seeing was you were seeing a lack of diversity from you know, moving from one district to another. So mm -hmm. I, I've always been very torn about choice. And I've never really liked it. I saw what it did to my former district. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm fully supportive of the superintendent's recommendation, at least at this point, mm -hmm. that we withdraw from, the, uh, from uh, school choice at this point. Other comments? 
Uh, I would concur. I think that um, it is troubling to me that we would be opening a door, especially at a, you know, a school like Hale, that is our, we were just talking about how capacity is a problem and you know we're having trouble, well, not trouble, but we're struggling to find creative ways to serve the children we have already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would want to focus first on that, wait for things to roll out with residential mm -hmm. neighborhoods being built, and maybe revisit it at a later time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that, I, 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 totally, I completely agree with you, and I think that that was one of the reasons why we've been doing it at every year the way that we have, because you don't know from year to year what's, what's coming on board. For example, if Lancaster came forward and, and said next year, you know what, we're, none of these subdivisions that we've planned are gonna go through, that, that would send a totally different message to us. Sure. Do you know what I mean? So, but right now we've, we've got yeah. <coughs> some substantial building happening, at, as I'd mentioned last meeting, in Bolton. Stowe, we're not quite sure right now because there's some, uh, some, uh, some good positive undercurrents that are happening over there. And Lancaster, we aren't sure what's gonna happen with the subdivisions. So we've got three communities that are some form of growth right now. I feel personally that I wanna make sure that we take care of our own first. And that's not being anything other than a superintendent taking care of her own communities before we open the doors. Um, I recall in years past when we did have the school choice option, that, that it, and this predates you, I believe, so you might, you may or may not be able to answer it. This is kind of a process question anyways, but um, that it was at entrance into school choice was through a lottery system, is that right? If you have, if you advertised three um, spaces in grade two, and you got 10 applications, then okay. you would do a lot of it. So, so just to be clear, it's not a com like a completely open, like the floodgates are open as, right, so it, it is limited in that sense. You spaces right. okay. in particular okay. Okay. grades. Good, I'm glad to clear that yeah. up. Okay. Other comments? Uh, I have a process question. So with the lanes motion, it seems that, I just want to be clear that you're asking us if we want to remove ourselves from the school choice program? Well, for this year, you have to vote right. every year. But it's almost like, I'm gonna vote yes. So if I were to vote yes, that we means I want to leave. Yes. Yeah, the state law is you're automatically in school choice unless you vote opt out. Right, yeah. Thank you, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a little tricky. So you have to opt out of it. Yeah. Other? <coughs> um, my feeling is that, um, again, I'm concerned about the uncertainty of um, the, the development in, in all three of the towns. And then the other thing I think about is that you might have room at some level, but everybody moves up, and then you're in another school where there might not be room, so it's that domino effect. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that bothers me the most is the reimbursement. The reimbursement doesn't even, barely puts a dent in what our per pupil expenditures are. And I think that, for me, with the, the budgets, how tight we have to make our budgets, and you'll, you'll see the work that we have to do to get them to a certain um, place, um, I just don't feel it's a, it's a good time. We had talked about at some point, maybe offering it at, level, uh, uh, at entry points, kindergarten, grade six, grade nine. Um, but even for me, that, there's just too much uncertainty about development. If we knew that Goodrich Brook Estates, or whatever it's called, was a no-go, I might feel differently. But I really, they're talking 500 units. That's a lot of units. Yeah. So um, that's and what I think. there a few kids in those 500 A units. few, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, any other comments or questions? Steve? Well, the only, the only other comment I would make is that I know that uh, on an annual basis, or at least when we do contract negotiations, that sometimes the issue comes up, there, is te there are teachers who would like mm -hmm. their children, mm -hmm. teachers who do not live in the district, they mm -hmm. would like their children to be able to come to mm -hmm. school in our district. Mm -hmm. And um, when we, if we opened it up, Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, if we opened it up, we kind of lose that bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. People ready to vote? 
You want to read the motion one more time so we know what we're doing? All right. The motion is to withdraw from participation in the school choice program for the 2020-2021 school year. All those in favor of withdrawing from the school choice program for the 2021 school year. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, the um, next thing has to do with um, policies. We are so close to being done. So um, uh, I think it was back in October, we had a few that we held out and I, I sent everyone, and it's, it's actually also posted to the meeting materials, that we had two policies, three policies that we had questions about, DED and DFG, investment of funds. Um, and so I worked with Dorothy and um, with the help of Alita, did some uh, dumpster diving back into the archives of uh, minutes. And so uh, MASC has not seen anything remotely like this policy in other district manuals. MASC has no po model policy for anything like this. Dorothy checked with colleagues who work with more regional districts than she, and they also report no similar policies. The policy was adopted on May 18, 2006. The meeting minutes reflect the motion to adopt and then the vote to adopt. There are no meeting minutes from the policy subcommittee prior to March 2012. So we don't know where this came from. There's, there's no trail of breadcrumbs leading us back. Um, and so I think that um, I am comfortable removing it from G because we don't use it and it really has no bearing. From D, I mean. It was the, the recommendation from the policy committee at the time was to delete it and there were questions. So we don't, if we want to reinstate it, if you want to just keep it deleted, that's... We're putting this to motion? Well, we already voted D in, in form, and so we wanted clarity about that. The recommendation was to delete it. So if we voted it in form and the recommendation was to delete it, we don't have to do anything unless somebody wants to reinstate it, then they would move to do that. Okay, we could, it's deleted. Okay, so then CM, the school district annual report, um, so that was a policy and there were a couple of other questions that came up about reporting of enrollment and summer school. And we do not have discrete items on the agenda to deal with those things, but they are included in, well, we get reports all the time, and then the other stuff is, is reported in through the budget and other things. So um, there does, according to MASC, there does not need to be a discrete agenda item for reporting of um, the uh, annual report, if it comes to us in other ways, which it does. Mm -hmm. So the, the vote was to keep it as is by the original policy or the previous policy committee. So unless somebody wants to change it, we will go with their original recommendation. Okay. So then for um, J, which is the last remaining policy section. Mm -hmm. Once we put this to bed, it goes to MASC and within a couple of months, our policy manual will be online. We'll have a link, MASC will um, keep it for us. We'll have a link to it and we can still do changes and add to it as we go through our committee. Instead of doing five clicks and having to download documents, we will just be able to click and have it appear. So that's our goal. And will it, will it be searchable? Yes. <coughs> and not only will you see ours, but you'll see everybody else's, which is good, so you have a quick way oh, to compare. That's amazing. All right. So the one that we had questions about, JEB entrance age. So, um, and looking at this, it sounds confusing, but it's predicated, I think, on the fact that um, kindergarten, attendance in kindergarten is not mandatory. Attendance in first grade is. If a kid does not go to kindergarten, 
and their birthday is October 1st, and they come to sign up for first grade, and they're technically five, <coughs> we can still take them as a first grader, even though they didn't go to kindergarten. And I'm sure there's all sorts of testing that mm -hmm. they do oh, for yes. readiness and stuff like that. So that's essentially what that means. Is everybody cool with that? Because the recommendation was to accept it with the part that was added. Um, initial admission of children to the first grade or other grades will involve a consideration of both chronological age and the readiness of the children uh, to do the work. And that's th the purview of the school to do that assessment. Yes? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I lost you a little bit because I was actually trying to look up the statutory reference there. Mm. Um, I'm a right had questioned this particular policy, um, and I'm just and I was just trying to look up whether the added language is that part of the statute. Do we know? I'm just looking to see myself. I think it is. I think that's new. So it's one is one. It's one G. It's um, uh, fifteen one G. G. Mm hmm. Talks about advisory councils to board membership duties. You think we have the wrong citation? Well, no. It, it, whether, whether we have the wrong citation or not, I, it, I guess my question is: it doesn't really matter because we don't have to cite statutory authority for our own policies. I guess my question is, and, and maybe I was just too busy and distracted looking up the statute when you mm -hmm. described mm -hmm. the, the additional <coughs> language. It says that. In, Initial admission of children to the first grade or other grades, parenthetically, will involve a consideration of both chronological age and the readiness of the children to do the work. Mm -hmm. added. Okay, so I guess I don't understand what this really is saying. So a, children, a child presents itself, presents himself to the district, and then a determination is made at that point based on his age and his skill level as to where the child is going. There's, there's usually sort of a, a paper trail that kids have. If they go to preschool and kindergarten, that starts their little academic paper trail. It's not required that kids attend kindergarten. It's not mandatory that attendance, those attendance, that attendance data does not get reported to the DESC like other attendance data does. So, theoretically, you can have a child who did not attend kindergarten but has to enroll for grade one. If that child is five years old when they enroll because their birthday to turn six is until December, that means that we can admit them okay. if they present as... And you're not going to keep it... You're going to assess their readiness and then you're going to take them from where they are. I have been in districts where someone will want a nine-year-old kid to be placed in the sixth grade <clears throat> because of certain factors and it's, it's not advisable um, chronologically or even um, um, academically. So I think that's what that addresses. The school decides where the, the kid can be placed um, but you look at their age and their readiness to do the work. You're not going to put a nine-year-old in grade six. Okay. But yeah. this covers us. You have a, a, a mandatory start age for kids uh, or date for a kid to be five when they start kindergarten. But if they don't go to kindergarten here, or if they go to private kindergarten, there may be a different they not, might be. They might start grade one, and they'll still be five, but they're going to turn six sometime. All right. yeah. Can I? I guess, of course. I'm, I guess I'm just this. This baffles me. So this policy is regarding entrance age, mm -hmm. and it talks about the minimal entrance age and the date upon which the child must be five before they can enroll in the school. In kindergarten. In kin okay. Right. So yes. That's enrollment in, in kindergarten. Yes. And but then it goes on to say initial admission of children to the first grade or other grades yes. will involve a consideration. So are we talking, when you say other grades, what are, are we talking about just kindergarten? Or? No. No, no. This Kindergarten is the first paragraph. 
The second paragraph are other grades. An initial admit, admission means to the first grade that a kid did not go to kindergarten here. They're showing up. Now they may have a transcript from kindergarten. Um, they may, the, 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 the school they're coming from may have a different, maybe November 1st, that they have to be five to start kindergarten. But you look at the age and you look at what they've, what their transcript essentially says. I, I know Steve has a, a question, but I did want to follow up on this one after. Uh, yes, Steve. Okay, my, my question goes to um, the, the idea that uh, you have a kid who maybe had some homeschooling for a couple of years mm -hmm. and quite truthfully is advanced. And his age t says he should be in the third grade. Mm -hmm. But when you test him, he is actually should be in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Now I understand there are issues of social development and everything mm -hmm. else that you don't get at home, but you don't always get at homeschooling. But if he takes the tests mm -hmm. and he show and it shows he's he's reading at a fourth grade level, his math is at a fourth grade level, everything else is at a fourth grade level, yet he's seven. You make the determination based on the child. I mean, theoretically, that's what, that's that's what, what I'm, I'm saying. It's individualized I, 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 when the kid shows up. But this up. is what refers to other grades. Yes, issues, yes. Issues. Yeah, yeah. That, that's okay. But you make a determination with, sometimes you can have a kid, you find kids that are advanced in math, a sixth grader who can do algebra. You don't put him in the ninth grade, you offer him algebra in the sixth grade, but he's with his age mates and does other yeah. curricular things. And the nature of curriculum is that teachers can individualize to meet the needs. So they do it for kids with learning problems, and they also do it for kids who are advanced. You make a determination of what is in the best interest of the student. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but is that, is that the best interest of the student vis-a-vis -vis the um, established parameters of the school? It depends on it, the child. This is, this is what I'm, all right, to, to refer to TV, what if you've got a young Sheldon, okay? Mm -hmm. Or you've got a Doogie Hauser if you're a little, a little bit older. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, you know, and you've got, you how make, do you know? How do you deal with? You make a determination when the child shows up. Right. It's not a one that. size fits all. No, I understand that. Right. That's what I'm trying to. I'm not saying that you totally don't do that, but it's rare and you make a determination. It is rare. And so, I mean, there have been other cases, I mean, real life cases of, of uh, child prodigies who, you know, uh, probably should, you know, can do the academic work, may not mm -hmm. be socially adjusted to do it, but maybe, <laughs> maybe academically um, so, uh, advanced we, to do I, that. I, I get it, I so get it. What I'm, that's what I'm saying vis-a-vis -vis the policy. That's what it's saying vis-a-vis -vis the policy. In the that, policy is saying involve we consideration of both chronological age and readiness. Right. Right. So that's what we do. I think you're both on the same page, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's we're tired. what we do. I think you're on the same page. I think what he's trying to I don't want to speak for you, but I think what, how I'm reading it is that this language allows for the flexibility to do either. Fine. Yes. That's what, yeah. That's fine. Okay. So why are we fighting? We're not. I was. I was. Hopefully, I was just. I was. I was kind of helping Joe with, with his uh, but understanding of that second paragraph. Like that. Okay. Yeah. I. I'm. It, I know this is not a, a, a very complex policy, and it's. I'm not meaning to take up any time with this. I'm just having a hard time getting my head around. So it's entitled Entrance Age. Paragraph one speaks to the minimal age for enrollment in our kindergarten program. Period. Well, okay, right. Paragraph two, this is the added language. I guess this is where I go. So I'm talking about initial admission of children to the first grade or other grades. So I'm reading this as being something other than just entrance age. And what are you I'm, reading it as? Well, the parenthetical phrase, or other grades. Mm -hmm. So initial admission of the children of children to the first grade or other grades will involve a consideration of both chronological age and the readiness of the child to do the work at mm -hmm. it. Okay, so uh, are we talking just about first grade there? And no, that's what it's it's okay. but I, I understand what, exactly what you're saying. Like there's a piece of me that says, like, uh, I do understand why, why you're thinking the way you're thinking because if you really look at this, if you're thinking about this entrance age, you're thinking the little people coming up. What's confusing is the words or other grades. Right. I, I feel like if that wasn't in there, this would all make sense. It, that's my point. And I, yeah. and why is why is or why other is grades, or other in, grades in, in, in there, right? right. Because, and, and the truth is, it, it really does look like if you take a look at it, 
It really, oh, sorry. Mentioned. It really does look like it's uh, like for for our youngest children coming into the system. <coughs> and so that's why when we've got those other words in there or other grades, it seems confusing. I'm not disagreeing with either Kathy or, or Steve, by the way. I get it, it, you're, you're both right, quite frankly. Uh, but I do think that, I think that that creates a different layer. That's why there's even discussion because if you think about it, that's why even this discussion even happened is because of the word or other grades. If that wasn't in there, I think it's just a lot simpler. Because there are people who want to, if they move in, they want their child in a different grade than the, chronologically, chronologically or what the transcripts show the child should be. So this says that the it'll, it'll be... It gives a flexibility. Yeah. That's flexibility, but it's the school that assesses the readiness. But it's confusing because yeah. the ta the uh, the title says mm -hmm. entrance age, and so entrance age you think of our our youngest players. Leah, but I know that in Hudson we have kids arrive at the high school from different countries. Yep, yeah. and we have to decide what grade to put them in. Yep, yeah. and so entrance age is really about like the moment mm -hmm. a student arrives. Mm -hmm. So that first paragraph is specific just to kindergarten. That's the right. The second paragraph is is covering everybody, every student, everybody answers. new that comes. And it's not a, a, pro, a, a widespread problem, but it's there for when there are issues. And like Steve, like Steve's example is a good example of those kids because we do have we do have a number of homeschoolers mm -hmm. who come into our system. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that kind of thing would be oh. totally applicable. Uh, so, but I under I do understand the notion of that entrance age. You just automatically think of it mm -hmm. as our youngest. Mm -hmm. Are we all? ready to because it was accepted in the thing we just had questions about it you can see why the questions <laughs> yes can we move on to JAB okay so JAB is student involvement in decision making on my note is that the school committee has expressed an interest in examining how this policy is actualized in each of the schools initially focusing on the high school that does not necessarily require change to the policy so what we're interested in are whatever protocols or procedures there are, but the yeah, uh, but the policy is is okay, um, and it was accepted uh, by the other committee. Now, um, with regard to the student <coughs> advisory committee, as I mentioned earlier, MASC has advised that school districts follow the spirit of this law for the most part. There are some that don't follow it at all. While MASC concludes that our current practice of student reporting at our meetings meets the spirit of the law, school committee members have expressed an interest in increasing the scope of the student report as well as having this member be elected as a representative of the student body. I think, and that doesn't have to be in the policy, it's just um, capturing the discussion. Um, so with an understanding that we're not required to follow the letter of the law, and Joe's going to see if he can get it repealed. Our, um, our um, interest is really in making it a more meaningful role. So, yes. Can I just add that we're at our policy meeting on January 6th. Yes. That we're going to take this up. Yes, we are. Yeah. So, so again, this was um, um, accepted by the previous um, group, the policy committee, and we just had questions about it. And then there was another policy, JKAA and JKAA-R, um, and it was on um, the policy regarding to uh, restraint, the restraint policy, mm -hmm. and there was a note on it that Donna, who was the previous nurse leader, mm -hmm. would review from 2017. I checked with Joan. Joan said that the policy JKAA is current with current regulations and JKAA slash R are procedures and should not be in the policy manual. So um, I think that we would vote to accept those because there was no determination of it. So any questions about JKAA? I have a motion to accept. JKAA so as the, yeah. second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Okay. Accept as presented. Accept as presented. And then to delete JKAA slash R, the procedures for student restraint. Can I have a motion? 
to delete that from the post. Second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Um, that includes our examination <laughs> of policy section uh, J. Um, and we, um, now we have to um, make a motion to accept section J in form. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? If I had confetti, I would be tossing it up in the air. <laughs> Is this done now? Tooth to veto, as we say. Did, 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 did you have a, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I just had a question before sure. we were going to vote. So I'm going to second the motion. I just wanted a, a question. What does that mean, inform? What does it mean, inform? That's what I was told to say. Just in. It's in form until MASC goes through and makes all the oh. spelling errors, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Understood. They're going to take it. The other thing I do want to mention, and thanks, you reminded me, and I did make a, um, a note about it. Um, but understandably, there are close to 300 policies, and we don't really scrutinize all of them. But I think Section J, which has to do with students, I think we spent a lot more time looking at it and asking questions. And there are policies that are, like Mike uh, referenced the one on uh, <coughs> student welfare, which is, is pretty uh, consistent with those in other districts. Mm -hmm. But what we probably want to know more about are the procedures involved with them. So we may be coming back to you guys with questions about different ways that policies are actualized. Mm -hmm over the course of the year. Okay? Okay, so moving right along. A budget and Did warrant report, Mr. Rubenstein. Yes, there was yes. a meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what? We voted on it? Yes, we did. Okay. Did we vote? Well, we did, but I don't know if Mike voted. I I believe he did okay. not. I did, I did not vote because okay. I was... All right, that's okay. Let's do it again. Let's, it's a do-over. Steve all, and Elaine. All those in favor? Yep. There we go. Opposed? All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Budget there was a warrant. meeting with the Budget and Warrant Committee earlier this afternoon, about mm -hmm. 4.30. Four mm -hmm. Seems like a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Almost <laughs> five hours ago. Stamina. And what we, what we did was we went over some, uh, some pieces of the budget and how the budget is allocated mm -hmm. so that new people uh, could, um, we could give them a, a feel of, of how the uh, allocation process goes with the formulas and everything else so that they would have, at least in the back of their minds, a, a general understanding of how these things happen. We also uh, went through uh, a little bit of the drivers, of the major drivers of the budget, which includes salaries for, for faculty, um, school bus costs, and facilities management, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So just so that they would have a basic <laughs> understanding. We understand that uh, the budget or the first cut budget will be presented to us in January. We do have the uh, budget workshop on the last Saturday in yeah. January, whereas each of the people, the principals and the department heads and everything else will come before us and make a presentation of what they want. Um, and then it goes back to the administration and they will come back to us at some point with basically what we can live with. Okay. Thank you. Mike, um, personnel? Uh, personnel met last week on the 11th. Uh, we had a cameo appearance by Kathy Kodian. Uh, <laughs> and uh, discussing her PLT uh, experience uh, with the uh, students uh, at the high school, uh, a discussion of how uh, information and communication is disseminated among the student body. Um, and I think our charge, at least in the short term moving forward, is to review the communication plan, uh, the district communica communication plan to review both the line of communication um, that is appropriate um, in uh, involving student welfare and also we talked about um, actually the communication lines uh, and opportunities that students have to reach out to uh, other members of the staff. Um, we also discussed the importance of providing um, um, s uh, the notion that providing students with a voice ties directly into the district improvement plan, um, uh, both in the social emotional learning goal and in the school culture goal, uh, or the professional practice goal. 
Uh, and then we talked about the January 2nd meeting and um, the importance of that meeting in allowing staff to provide feedback and ask questions um, to, among others, uh, Mike Maccaro and, uh, and Marie. Um, uh, and so again, our, our plan moving forward is to unpack the communication plan and revisit them. Thank you. Leon, anything from policy? We're going to meet on the 6th. We just did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and just reported. So uh, there's nothing new to report other than we plan to also pick up talking about the schedule. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, let's see. Consent agenda. Um, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda of December 18th, 2019? containing the warrants of December 20th, 2019, and the meeting minutes of December 4th, November 26th, and November 20th, 2019. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Um, items to be considered for next and future agenda. Um, um, Mike had suggested an OPEB workshop for the new members so that we can understand. The old members. Uh, I'm sorry. And old numbers. Well, oh, I was thinking he was a new member. Because you're so oh, okay. new. Yeah. Right. You still have that new member smell. Right. right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but toward the end of the year. And, and I, I, we can talk about when. Um, but yeah, but I think that's a good idea because we've had a lot of turnover. So then for the next meeting, um, January 15th, we have the college report card, program of studies review. Uh, the superintendent's mid-year review. Uh, we have a student presentation from the Burbank students, special education update, and early education update. Do we want to move that, the last one? Yes, the last one shouldn't be there. Okay. The preliminary, like, we'll take that off now. Okay. Um, all right. So then for the special education update, a couple of meetings ago I handed out folder with information about special education. We are not going to go through those during the meeting. They're just to give you some background. Um, anything else that you have for that meeting? I think that's no. a lot. I, it is a lot. It's, it's going to be a full meeting. Um, Mike. Mike. Um, so I don't know if this is an item for an agenda or a request um, for the superintendent, but um, when um, personnel met and we were discussing the professional practice goals, we talked about um, the um, goal with regards to the uh, culture and the climate of the high school and providing updates. And I would really appreciate, whether, again, whether it's an agenda item or if it's through the superintendent's report, um, somewhat regular updates so that we know how the high school is doing sure. uh, with regards to climate and culture. I think, I don't know what the expectations are for the January <coughs> meeting, but could, they, could we get information, feedback from that? Or let's work, let's see what we can schedule in. Um, but I understand uh, what you're getting at. And I think some of the things we're going to be talking about, some of the questions, will sort of naturally provide those. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we can talk about that. Any, any other suggestions? Yes. Um, I would suggest for a future meeting, not in January, that mm -hmm. we um, get an update on environmental sustainability topics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of what's going on and, and where the district's at. And you know, there's, uh, there's some, a couple of really interesting things happening across the district, so that'll give us a chance to share some of that. Okay, okay. great. Um, okay, we have a rather extensive break, so I wish everyone a wonderful holiday season. Recharge your batteries. We'll get to the budget season. So can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank uh, you so much, everyone. Enjoy happy the holidays. holidays. Happy holidays. Oh, I'm going to sign those. Yeah, you're the only one. Uh, if, if you would like this, this is.